Let's go to Ryan Christian. We have a guest. I could have seen it on his show. I was about to say I probably saw it on Ryan's show, so he might even know he could answer your question. Ryan, how you doing? Hey, good, Richard. How are you? Thanks for having me on. I'm doing wonderfully well. Do you know the answer to the question about uh, during the World Government Summit this past week? There was a, a video of someone making a comment on how they're going to wipe and like make wipe the banking system and like make a new accounting system with along with a new digital currency. And I wasn't sure if I maybe saw it on one of your live streams or where no, it was. I don't think so, only because my the depth that I have uh, I, I, on the world that meeting comes from Derek's research and his recent article. So he might be the better one to ask on that topic. I haven't dove too deep on on that meeting in general. But all right, good, me. good, because uh, Derek will be here later. I can ask him that. I definitely didn't see it on his show though, so I'm still I'm trying to help LD in the control room. We'll find that clip. I'll. I can find it later if I have to. So, uh, Ryan, uh, you want to introduce yourself to the audience for those who don't know you? Because I could. The Last American Vagabond. You write, you create, you're a musician, you're a deep guy, but you also have like a staff of writers that do incredible work and you're purveying their highly censored work to the world. You're walking the edge, getting banned and censored places. I don't hear you complain about it. I see you do like consistent, incredible productions of like deep dives that I can only get in like once a week and you're like doing it daily. So uh, as someone who does like the hundred mile marathon, I look at you with the 200 mile marathon under his belt and I think I can go further. Uh, how did you get to do what you do and, and, and why do you do it every day the way that you do it? You know, it's, I think it's something that we all probably have in common in this regard. I think that there is a, a need to cut to, do something that's not being done, you know, and that's kind of a, just a, a classic human trait, like to fill a need. I mean, that in everything we do, even our markets, our economy, it's all built around the idea of something like that. I think that's what we are doing when your show, our show, there's people, I don't know if it's the same story for you for how this kind of started, but I just had this feeling before I really even knew what was going on. Right. I mean, I, I remember, as I've said many times on different shows, I remember the time when I first kind of stood back and was like, wait a minute, I'm watching two different mainstream channels and they're telling me that this is fact, excuse me, and this is fact, and they're talking about the same story, but they're saying two different things. And you're going, well, wait a minute, how is that even possible? Like, you know, the mind that thinks that they're fact, the news is only fact or mainstream media. And so I just kind of had this drive to start doing something, you know, like, well, I want to put my thoughts out there. Like, I never thought it would become what it was today. I just started doing something random. Actually, I was on a trip with a friend of mine, and he started writing a blog which kind of just got, gave me the, the motivation to do that. And it, it started all around cannabis and everything else, but it always centered around trying to poke holes in the lies that were being pushed around primarily cannabis to begin, but then it broadened out into everything, foreign policy. I mean, I think COVID really opened that door for a lot of people. And I think that's bleeding over into the Ukraine manipulations that you were lied to about basically everything. I mean, that's not even really hyperbole today. It's, it's quite incredible, but that's in a nutshell, just, you know, I've just had this burning desire to push back against the lies, you know? Well, that's good. Like, uh, I didn't really, before I got into doing some heavy duty, like full-time research, the biggest conspiracy thing I knew about was like JFK, but other word, other, otherwise, like my, my views were pretty much status quo. But then once I started to find some cracks in that pavement and see things growing through, I'm like, what's under the pavement and what, you know, what's the underground history of America, of American education, these sort of things. And, uh, there's so much more under the pavement, like the pavements, the thin strip on top of the field, the whole field's a story. And they tell us, it's just like this, here's the right. cement, walk across here. Don't walk on the grass. And you're like, the grass is a real story, which I, is I, a, you know, call back to how you started. There's a cannabis pun for the audience. There we yeah, go. Yeah. Right. There you go. I, I mean, I keep, I keep finding this in everything I'm doing every single story. I mean, it's never done, you know, like, you know, you, I, it, that's the, the thing we should all remember in this is that we never, there's always something more to see behind it. There's always more to the story, you know, and, and for me, let's just take, for example, Ukraine, you know, I was very well, well versed on Crimea and, and, uh, you know, 2014 regime change. And even before that, you know, as much as more than most, I would argue, but not to the depth of some of them out there, but then this kind of started and I was, you know, primed and ready to be like, okay, there's going to be manipulations here. There always are. And the dive into the real background of the Azov Battalion and, and the, the fascist build by the CIA from, as my research shows, at least 1948 forward, it just, blew, it, I mean, it sh I shouldn't say it blew my mind. I'm like, well, it's like, I almost expected to find this kind of stuff, but it's like, it, I didn't know that before, you know, and the more you, you kind of blossom this story, it just blows your mind. And then you find one more part of it and it opens up a new story and it ties into the something else. Like, like the, the things that we think we know, like I remember looking into, um, 
like the world, the full one and two World Trade Center bombing and, you know, these different stories. And, and you find that there's more around there. There's more like MK Ultra ties and, you know, these different things that you didn't really pick up on from Corbett's work is where I'm talk, referencing there. And just, it never stops. You know, it just keeps, it keeps blossoming and it, the lies just get bigger and bigger, you know, and that's what I really want people to see today is that we can't just get comfortable because somebody else gets voted in, you know, it, the lies are going to perpetuate for sure. Yeah. 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 All right. So uh, your mic's coming in a little high and low. It, like it hasn't got too loud. It's been a little low, but I don't know if zoom's maybe like auto modulating or, or something like that. So I don't usually use zoom. I'll try to stay still. Uh, yeah, I, did, they, I, did, I was noticing something funny on the settings when I got started. So that makes sense to me, but I'll try to stay still for you. Yeah. I don't think it's a big deal. As long as the audience can hear you. Uh, I'm not, I'm not finicky. And then I wanted to dig into like this Azov battalion. There's a long history goes back to like 1947 ish. Is that what you said? Well, what's interesting is the the history around the CIA's yes. essentially cultivating fascism in Ukraine to be, uh, to, in that case, in the beginning, it was to be used against the Soviet Union, where it's the same idea now, but now it's Russia. It's the same, it's the same concept. But the Azov Battalion came into this, as far as I can tell, like the what in, in the context of the CIA manipulating it around 2014, 15, like sure. post regime change. And then they had this operation under Obama where the CIA was sent in both for administration things but as well as military operations and that's been admitted by even western mainstream press but under the guise of sort of like fighting for freedom as they always try to you know play the game but the history shows quite clearly that these people were not just that they knew that not that they were extremists but that they knew that they were extremists and chose them because they were extremists and it's important to, to note right there as i'm really continuing to try to point out nationalism it's not an inherently negative thing or even right. I should I should even say it's not a negative thing. It's the, the extremist level of anything, for that matter, where it becomes negative, like to, to have pride in your country, whatever that country may be, and have meant an idea in that way that maybe people disagree with. But that's not wrong. You know, so yeah, the, I think the it's a natural frame, thing for a lot of people because they're just like the people that they live around. They're proud of their country. Yeah. That's right. They're not choice, seeing right? like the governmental baggage that might come with these sort of things. Um, were you referring to Operation Gladio? I was going to bring that up. There. Yeah, I was no, like, well, I was what like, I'm actually okay. referring to is it's called Operation Aero, or it, it, it just says uh, Project Aerodynamic is what it was called. Project Aerodynamic. Mc, uh, Mc, uh, his name was McLeod Lebed, I think, or Mikhaila Lebed. And this is a this is a guy who was a what, Nazi war criminal. Mm -hmm. He was he was arrested for murdering the Polish Polish uh, Minister of Interior, sentenced to death for it, and, and escaped when when Germany invaded Poland. Now this guy is a an open extremist. He he's the, the, the party, the group he worked with was Ukrainian uh, organization for nationalism. I think, I think that's the term I have to look it up, but this was a group that the CIA chose because of their extremism. They compared it to Italian fascism. The point is they, they picked him because of this. And that was uh, the, the 1948 beginning of this sort of, or technically that was 1953 when the, when the project began, but 48 was when they began cultivating this group. And I think I, I see a document come up there that might be, yeah, I was just thinking because the overlay would be like right around that same time, Operation Gladio was like MI6 and CIA having all these stay behind forces to battle communism, and they would have armed groups like that. And then oh, the yeah. other reference I had for you was this, and we can go to whatever Tony or LD have, uh, the Belarus secret. And this is where, let me get it smaller. This is where CIA and MI6 took all these Nazis. And then they smuggled them to the United States and in and, and Europe uh, and England as well. But this Belarus is right next to Ukraine. And these Belarusian Nazis were moved slightly outside of where they were. And it's a whole interesting story. This is by the uh, attorney, John Loftus, who used to work for the, uh, the Department of Justice. And he wrote several other books. But this one in particular, it, he didn't talk about, I don't think he talked about Gladio in here because this was written in like 1982. Gladio doesn't even come out to the public till 1991 around there. So, um, but it's like the proto, if you didn't know about Gladio and you overlaid that, you'd say these people were part of that same project. So I was wondering right. if this group that is now in power in Ukraine, if they had been groomed over the past 60 years by uh, covert intelligence forces, weapons, smuggling weapons, caches prep, just in case the Russians get uppity, right. Just in case. And that was also tied into the Italian. That's why it's called Gladio. Cause that's the Italian word for sword. So it was operation sword down there, but it really is used to refer to that bigger network right. of, uh, espionage and terrorism <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean i wouldn't be surprised if it i mean it, it might it could very well be one and the same maybe one is on, in, under the umbrella of the other or so, you know something like that but at the end of the day 
it, I, I would, that would make sense, but it would also make sense that there's just a multitude of projects and operations operating all around MI6, CIA, you know, whatever. For sure. To, but it's the in the same thing. kind of template or pattern oh, yeah. of oh, yeah. like their the archetype. Well, yeah. Let's, right. let's, put it, let's put it this way. It's the yeah. same exact archetype and pattern as everything else they've been doing in any other situation you want to look at. I mean, this is not new. It, it's the same. It goes That's back to the 19th century, the British State Department. Exactly. Yeah, this Medini, is not even a, yeah. Yeah, this is not even originally American. I mean, this is just, the, yeah. this is manipulation. You know, this is wartime propaganda. You know, we can yes. look at like Bernays Forward and we can definitely see the way that social engineering has become a very focused kind of thing, but it's been around for a long, long time before that. It's it's quite alarming though. I mean, you can look at, that's why we talk about the new Al-Qaeda. You know, like Whitney coined it as uh, Ukraine, the new Al-Qaeda. My first discussion was sort of like, this is the new Syria. And it's the same conversation. You know, it's like they're using the same template right in front of us. It's It's incredible. And they continue to do it decade after decade, but like by the time, so like right now they're running stuff that's very similar to things they did in the 1970s with the, uh, the inflation and the oil and stuff like that. But most people who are my age, they, they, they barely remember that. And the kids younger than me, they don't know anything about that to them. They don't see the record replaying and restarting. Mm -hmm. right? Right. So it's like, they think on these multi-generational long cycle plans, Right. Like the, what the World Government Forum and the World Economic Forum and these sort of World Government Summit, World Economic Forum, what these groups are doing, like the plans were laid down like 100 years ago and they're still executing on let's drain the wealth out of America through the Federal Reserve until there's nothing left. And then they switch on digital currency for everybody. And it's a social credit system tied up. You know, See, that's important. It's important for people to recognize it's not just one thing. Right. It's not it's all about the population or it's all about this or it's all about that. At the end of the day, there's a multitude of, of agendas. And I was actually re making a running list when COVID started about all the different so-called conspiracy theories that were being like driven in because of it. And I just stopped doing it. I'm like, let's just call it everything. It's it's like one. It's total warfare. It's total Seriously. warfare. Every every possible angle they are attacking for food, water. Uh, our ability to provide for ourselves in the form of uh, what you know our productive labor. Um, I think it was war, Engdahl who said he, he coined technology. it because his book was called Full Spectrum Dominance. William mm -hmm. Engdahl. That I think it was him. I'm not sure. Well, I know that's... the title. I'm not. I'm not, not sure if the name is correct. I don't know, but the, the title I recognize. Yeah. I mean, just that, that idea of, of like, there's a spectrum and they're hitting you on all, every area at the yep. same time. And uh, well, they, yeah. they know that creates a level of psychosis. I mean, this is like documented exactly. research, right? I mean, it's like, it puts you in a position where you're so completely unsure of almost any, you know, I always reference specifically uh, a brave new world. It's, there's a little bit of a different context in that compared to the others where, you know, it's kind of, it's like engineered apathy as opposed mm -hmm. to fear and, you know, like being aware that you'll be certain. It's like, you don't even care, you know, take your pill, sit back and just check out. That's like the McDonald's Walmart kind of scenario that I always point out. And it's very real. I agree. I yeah, unfortunately the, think it's more of a model for what is happening and is to come. Yeah. Look, the bread and circus further. model's not broken, Tony. You don't want to fix it, you know? <laughs> That's right. Right. Why reinvent the wheel? They're like, just add to it. Just add to yeah. it. <laughs> Some technology on top of it will be good, right? Yeah, that's so, the thing. Like, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rich. I was just going to ask, like, what's your workflow to get prepped and do a show like you do as regularly as you do? You got to have some process. You got to have some discipline in order to achieve the consistency that you do. And these yeah. things are noticeable from a producer's perspective. So I wanted to inquire, like, what's your process? How do you, how does a Ryan Christian uh prepare for these epic long form solo dude you're doing it you're doing it live in the in the true style no excuses like you, right. you get it done and then you had that round table the other day that was really interesting too oh, so you, you mix up you. your format right mm -hmm. it's not always like just the daily rundown which is super useful by the way yeah. uh but you know you have an interesting coterie of friends with whom you work you're kind of like living the dream you're writing your own script in life. This is not something that you really trained from, at, you know, young, young age being groomed to like do this thing. You figured out this stuff on your own. You had to be, uh, you know, self-reliant and you had to have some self-confidence. And I think also where you lacked any of these things, you had that burning desire to be like, you know what? People deserve a better perspective or a better option for choice because these people are being lied to. So yeah. like, how's it work for you? Well, the, I don't want to forget to address the process. Oh, I think that's an interesting question. Happy birthday. I meant to oh, say you. yesterday, yes. and I, I noticed that you were on the schedule for the day after. I was like, I wrote a note. I'm like, say happy birthday. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How old are you? Well, uh, 30, 39, 39. Woo. I remember 39. Yeah. <laughs> did you do anything? Did you do anything fun? 
No, I'm weird about my birthday. I don't know why it's, it's not even about age for me. I, don't, I honestly, I don't, I, I wouldn't have remembered my number if someone had brought it up and I'm actually <laughs> was hoping to tell people like, don't say the number. Cause I can't even remember what it is. And then somebody said, it, I was like, damn it. But I'm the uh, same it, way. Yeah. So 80, 1983, the number, it doesn't really matter. Right. I mean, how, at some point down the line, you're going to be like, what is it? My 60, 70. It's like, who cares? It doesn't even matter. So, Do I have right? the senior citizen discount yet? So where were you born? 1980, <laughs> 1983, 83. Correct. 83. All right, good. I was born in 73. That's how I calculated math in, in a real time live stream. Otherwise, I wouldn't attempt it. <laughs> it. It usually turns disastrous, but I was like, I could do that. Um, 1983, I was in third grade. You got to grow up in a good age of music because you missed the yeah. early 80s stuff, you know, and by the time have, I also had my dad and my, and my and my late grandfather, a huge influence you know, a lot of Beach Boys and, and you know, 60s era music and different stuff that I really kind of absorbed. And really, that was my focal point of music when I was in like high school. So I was more of like the weird one that was, you know, from a different, you know, play, all, playing all the Bob Marley and different stuff like that, that people thought was weird. And, you know, and, but then you broaden out into it. And I, I, you're right. I think it was a really great, I actually feel like it was sort of like the end of the last like rock stars, like real rock stars. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. I agree. We, we've all <laughs> seen it and we know it because we've Especially seen COVID. what came afterwards. Yeah. I did Don't get to see COVID, like rage with the machine and all these horrible people that just went the other direction. It's like anti-establishment <laughs> unless we're scared about flu or whatever. It's like, oh, damn it. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to talk music sometime. I got to, uh, I got to yeah. see Brian Wilson play pet sounds album from the first row at like bb king in new york nice. little little theater and he wasn't too with it anymore mm -hmm. but to be able to hear like uh, you know i grew up my my dad uh usually had control of the radio so i grew up and i know all the 50s and 60s songs all the way through the 70s so i know yeah. a lot of decades before i was born you seem to also have that that added element because it helps you to bond with older people people yeah. older than us and if you can talk music it's a place where you can start to uh open communications so well, like yeah. And, it, and I think it also, it, it helps you. I mean, I, I, I hate to bring it to the negative because I definitely think that music and any kind of media at some level is used to manipulate people, you know, the way you think, the way you perceive things. And so I think it's a different era of music. You know, it's like, it's kind of, I look at it like if you're watching only TV and stuff from like 20 years ago, you're not really being manipulated by the way they want you to today. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like a different kind of mindset. And so it, it's counterintuitive in a way to the propaganda. So maybe it's the way I look at it. All right. So let's go back to your process. Do you mm -hmm. listen to music while you prepare for a show? What do you do? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Well, I'm laughing about that. I, I, it might be more surprising for you to know that it's a little less organized than you might think. I mean, it's more kind of fly by the seat of my pants in a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm, I'm meticulous about a lot of others. So I do know what you mean. Like it has to be, if you're going to manage all this information, but the hard part for me to, to start in the middle of this is that it's, it's a, a daily thing or a, often every other day based on other things, interviews and stuff but it's a lot of information, you know? So it's like, it started out for me as a, you know, trying to make it like a quick thing. I mean, I still use the word concise to be quite honest, just to piss people off that can complain about the fact that it's a long show, but concise technically doesn't mean short. Let's just put that out there. It means a lot of information in a short period of time. And I'm, I'm talking about like three days of information in three hours. I think that's technically concise, but different point. But I feel like it takes a lot to manage all this together and get it in a way that kind of coordinates. And if I were to try to plan it, it would be impossible. I mean, I used to do that in a way and I would sort of have things written out when I was a little more nervous. And I also think it's funny if you go back and look at the very first thing I did. I, well, I don't think it's around anymore since YouTube censored it all, but it was pretty clunky for those out there that want to get started. I mean, it's, you just got to get it going, man. It's embarrassing. It's weird. And you just got to get through it. I'm all tight and, and the, the shots like right here. And I'm all, you know, it's like, it's just funny, but it, and I just kept going, like you said, just kept pushing. I want to make this work, but for me, it starts where I sort of like I, anything I think is important, I send to myself, you know, throughout the day when I'm not working, I just get people send me stuff. And I really took a page out of the book of James Corbett. I mean, I, I really he's one of my largest influences. I, you know, it's about open source. Anybody that wants to send me stuff, they send me stuff and I try to shout them out when I can, but it gets impossible after a while. And I just build it all up. And then when I'm ready to do the show, I pretty much sit down and I open up most of what I have and I go and i basically go through it tab by tab and i just kind of okay that's one thing and i that's oh yeah i want to talk about that and and i take it tab by tab and i pull it in and then i go oh, that goes with this and this organizes here and you know and it, it just it organically becomes a show and so it, it starts with what i think is important regardless of where it ties in but often enough i have to like chop off half the show and be like well i'll talk about covid tomorrow and you know and then, then i've got these multiple windows open with different things and i i close them before i go live people that freak out about how many tabs are open but <laughs> 
that, I really that, love like, seeing the tabs at the top, actually, because yeah. I, I I can relate to that. But it makes it stresses people out. I actually get it. It gives people anxiety when they're like, "Oh my god, there's too many tabs." <laughs> yeah, everyone's got a limit, and then that limit seems to creep on you. I used to limit myself to like just twenty tabs open. Now it's not. Now it might be like fifty tabs open. I would do I cut, fifty I tabs back, a day just to do I the cut show back part from seventy five. Yeah. No, I open stuff and close it as fast as I can. So I own th those are like fifty to dos up on my screen to me because some of these tabs have been open for a, a little bit you know See, that's the hard uh, part i stick myself into it i'm like I, i'm just like i'm the same way i'll have man that's been open for like a but week but you have a way to clear yours every couple of days right well, but, I, but i don't because you can that's the hard part and i think yeah. it's a lot of pressure when you're like i've got this whole block of stuff that i want to get to but it's before not you pressing. forget yeah well like let's say it doesn't connect to like the the day-to-day -day stuff right it's yeah. like this in-depth discussion of like nanotechnology I'm like, where do I, where do I shoehorn that in? If I already have like a three hour show, like, and that's the hard part for me is that I'm constantly, people don't know this, but it, it stresses me out. Like, I don't want it to be too long for people as much as at the same time, I'm constantly battling my own neurosis and my own, like, I can't not talk about that. And so it's like this game of, of, of balancing it every single day, you know? And it's like, that's the process, you know, it's just about, and, and, and to your other point, you know, I don't really do much else to be quite honest, you know, since this really started, it just took, it just consumed everything. And I allowed that knowing it was happening because this is important. I don't plan well, to do this at this level forever. You know, like I need to have a life and a wife and a child, you know, family, <laughs> you know, but it's like, but right now you're in the race and yeah. you're running it. So what if you took a look at that concept of it being too long and saying, what's a healthy amount of my, of my time to invest into this activity and let that be the length of it. Cause if you yeah. want to go six or eight hours and you can, that's a good workout. And it's hard for me though. That, that, that speaks to the part of me that's not I know. organized, right? Because yeah, I can't, yeah, yeah. I just like, I'll set my time and I'll be like, what am I on? Like two hours. Past but if that, you had different days. windows of activity, like one is you going through the tabs, one might be you going in and like looking stuff up and, and give us a glimpse into like a research part or you like starting to make a post or writing a blog on it. Right. Um, I used to do that. It was called research and review, but the problem was it became its own show. And I yeah. wouldn't, re I wouldn't go over it again because my two, my audience was there and they watched it all. And it's like, why yeah. am I going to do the show again? Yeah. It's redundant. It's okay. A good idea. It's a good idea. All right. Yeah. I was just trying to, I was just trying to think, cause it's like, um, had I considered what people would tolerate or consider too long. I, I mean, I've made in the past since, since 2006, like I started making podcasts in 2006. So within the first couple of years, I had a couple that were like probably 12 hours or something Ooh. like that right now that's not me oh. talking it's me taking a subject finding the best information that represents it cutting samples out of it making an intro doing a monologue to explain it and then giving you all the source material mm -hmm. that takes 12 hours so it might take you like three hours to get the gist and then if you listen to the full content where all those samples came from that's what the whole 12 hours would be by the you, time you i mean 12 hours prep to make the show no no 12 hour episode so the show is 12 hours long oh yeah and i wow, have that's, uh that's, that's that was 9 11 synchronicity and by the time i did my peace revolution podcast tony uh there were several of those episodes there were 20 hours because mm -hmm. it would be like jfk's 50th anniversary here's every piece of evidence you've never heard on this topic and we yeah. put it into a time capsule for the future so like the first three hours you can get the gist but it just makes you want to hear. Let me hear that whole Jim Garrison thing or whatever the situation was. Well, you, you cut know. it together to make it intelligible. So it's right. like you, yeah. you call it an interactive classroom. So it's interactive education where the people can sort of dive in at different points and you'll get the, the full context to what's going on. So there's a lot of like pre-production that goes into it that we have to edit it. We have to listen to all of these things, yeah. find the relevant timestamps, then put them together in a way that makes it understandable. So we're not just playing like disparate clips that have just been thrown together that make no sense. Yeah, and yeah. That's so these are of, like pieces yeah, it's, of it's art stuff, that yeah. I made, so, and and Tony was here for part of it, so he saw the process. I helped do some of them. I, it's, but I, I definitely think art is the right word for that. I mean, that must take yeah. weeks, weeks. Oh, right? it take like a month per episode, yeah. you know, wow. to because you got to find the source material, listen to it, then decide if it's good enough. So I'd start with a hundred hours and shrink it down to okay, here's the best twenty out of all that and how to orchestrate it. Well, but the, the same way you do the tabs, would, yeah. you know, as far as a range, like this ties into this. Once you get yourself in touch with like, these are the artifacts and source materials on any right. given topic. And you start to be like, how would I present these? Well, mm -hmm. this one at the end, the guy says this, and that ties yeah. into what this it's organic. Right. And you're the brain, you're the quantum computer processing that. That's why I always described it as art with a practical application of knowledge, you know, but right. That's a good way to put that it. took I mean, a lot of effort. And now we do this, which is my hobby time during the week. It's like six or seven hours and it's fly by the seat of our pants. I don't I even have it. the show card for the past two weeks in front of me. I and, um, 
yeah, it's, it's a little more similar to what you're doing, but you do yours more often and you have less people involved and the topics are like deep diver than what we yeah, get that, into that's here. One, that's one thing that people don't, don't really realize it, it's literally just me. I mean, there's a, there's a, there is a, 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 a you know, an IT lab group team that, you know, that are, that are doing, but this is why I'm, I'm really proud about the way that I've grown this. I, and I think that everybody that I brought on the reason that they continue to stick around is because I don't know anybody else that allows writers or anybody else involved to, you know, I mean, it's, it's ultimately my call at the end of the day, whether the stuff goes up on T-Lab, but I don't, I don't reach out and be like, cover the story, or they send me something and I'm like, I'm going to enter in these paragraphs and do this thing. I, I tell, I make a point to be like, look, I want you to cover what you are passionate about, because just like music, as you guys know, when people actually care and believe what they're singing and writing about, you feel that. So if, if they're just covering something because I told them to, that's not the same thing as them being like really packed. Like you read Derek's articles, you feel it. You read Whitney's articles, they care about this stuff, you know? And, and at the same time, they don't have to worry that I'm going to be like, no, tweak this or take that back. You know, even if I disagree with something, which happens. I'm like, well, I would write that differently, or I actually feel they did this. It's not, it's not that we need to realize that it's not that, you know, T-Lab has one opinion, you know, there's all sorts of multifaceted ideas coming out of it. If you read some of the older stuff that's on the website, it probably blow people's mind because it's, we've evolved quite a bit, you know, but I think that's super important. You know, we got to have that. It's funny. Cause I think they have a special feature on Twitter for uh, like, if I ever mentioned T-Lab in a tweet or uh, yeah, you're all dunces or D bros live, when I go to tweet it, it says, oops, something went yes. wrong. You have to try I'm again. Glad you said that. Everybody then, keeps telling me that. But if I go to, so the first time I did it, I tried to do it again. And they're like, you already posted that post. And they're right. like, right. And so then I, <laughs> this time when it happened, because I tweeted earlier today, I went to my profile and it did post. It just mm-hmm. tells me, it's just like a little warning. Like you're a little close to the line posting that on our platform. <laughs> Every single thing I post does that on Twitter. Every single thing I post does that. It says, ooh, it says error. And then you go, oh, where did you already posted yeah, it. Yeah. And then I look and it's there. And I'm like, what a weird process. Like, I wonder what that is, you know, like, yeah. and it's all, and everyone tells me that they post a T-Lab link. It does the same thing, you know? It's like the I, DMZ between North and South Korea. <laughs> you're in that zone. That's how, yeah. this, you know, <laughs> you're, you're right. close. I think they, they want you to feel like yeah like we're walking on eggshells like maybe i won't so i'll self-censor because they're just about to this is why i really want people to in, lean into the whole if you don't care about their censorship it's it's not important and the only reason the, the people are afraid to lose their connection if you build your network outside of their platform you can't be censored i mean i, I know people there's a little bit more work involved but i've been i, I proved this with youtube I might my, my video is getting two, 3000 views, a, 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 a video, regardless of what channel I put them on. And these are channels with like 46 subscribers. I've got like right now, like 40 plus different uh, pirate channels right now that people send me and I use. And so if you can get the views, if you can reach people because they just know how to connect, they, they, they go to my discord and I post the thing before I go live and they go to the channel if they want to use YouTube, which I ask them not to, but if you don't but care they about do it anyway, sometimes we're broadcasting yeah. right now on Jules Kroll. He loaned us his channel for tonight. He's a pirate channel. We Good. had Felix Good. Rodriguez. We have to thank you, we have to thank you Ryan, because we, we have took to that thank concept you, yeah. from you. Yeah, we're like, yeah. oh, yeah, this is a great Corbin idea. said it, but you yeah. did it. And we're like, yeah, we're doing <laughs> that too. I love it. I swear, to, I swear to you, I feel it. I know it by their actions and by the stuff that's happening. They don't, they, I mean, obviously at some small level, somebody's irritated that's happening because we're circumventing their control. But this is, I think it's bigger than that. I've seen things happen where I'm like, okay, this is on their radar. They're aware this is happening and they're aware that it's kind of bleeding out to where it's like, if nobody cares anymore, then we can't control this. It's kind of losing control. I'm starting to do it on Facebook and Twitter and it's, it's working to a degree, but I'm hoping people, I'm glad you're doing that, man. Awesome. Makes me happy. Yeah. And the, the other part I want to touch on is the censorship. Now they're trying to deep six everything right now. It's like Stalin airbrush and people, uh, you know, yeah. this is a, a time in history. So we didn't inherit like a clean history of what's going on. And part of what I've tried to do since 2006 is give people like the history behind the things that are going on especially like this book, but the, and and give a better sense of history to the people who come after us. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think what you do is a huge contribution to that. And it needs to be archived in an indelible way that anyone with access to the internet from here on forward should like have access to that, which exists, that, which you created. Now you got people recently, it's like Chris, 
Chris Hedges, you know, all his stuff got deep six. He lost all these interviews and Edward Snowden because of the RT thing and all this sort of thing. It's like, well, this has been going on for years. Yeah, it, you know, know. He's just the latest casualty. Right. Lee Camp's going to be uh, on the show next week. He's the latest casualty of these things. But it's like people like you were really early casualties because you were so close to the truth that they didn't want getting out there. These other sources that are kind of like more progressive they were allowed to exist longer but people like yourself they, they got to take you off the field early because you can't watch one of your 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 briefings and not come away from the sense of gee the tv is really lying to me like <laughs> yeah. you know what i'm saying because they're yeah. like what you're talking about is things that are published on the internet that people can then click in the links and see for themselves right. if they want to use their quantum computer right between their ears and start thinking about these things and you set a good example of doing that but in this face of censorship and needing to have your own platform well what if you have your own platform it's on wordpress and wordpress doesn't like what you're saying and all these other things and then the next thing they're going to do is take away the name address and right. we don't know each other's ip addresses to resolve and we can't communicate right so there are technologies and platforms are kind of like research and development right now but as far as getting your content and corbett's content and these other type of important contents to the indelible internet where it can go up and it's there forever and it can't be taken down that defeats that really pokes a hole in that big balloon of censorship that they're you know yeah. trying to use i agree well this is why we need new new directions i mean it, whether we're talking blockchain or even different technology than that, like the idea of a decentralized internet is something that I think is really important. And I, 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 the sad thing is that there's been a weird counter push, which, you know, I would even be willing to say that, you know, maybe they're right. I, I, I don't, I, I'm open to both arguments around this, but that, that there's just been like this weird kind of counter push around utilizing these technologies at a time when it's obvious they're going to be used against us, right? Like the central, mm -hmm. central, the, the That's government, well central currencies, uh, what the uh, CBDC, like, yeah. central thank bank digital currencies. Yeah. 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 And, and we all see it. It's obvious blockchain and these technologies. It's just like the analogy is like the internet, right? It's clear. The internet did not end up the way that they wanted it to right? this way. And this is the history. It's not a conspiracy theory. You can look up what it was a DARPA project. I guarantee it was not built for us to freely speak to each other. Back to like technically, 60s, it was, yeah. technically it was technically it was our naval intelligence where they I added the d yeah. right exactly exactly <laughs> and, and so the point so the point is that this now we're at a point where we have to think about how we can utilize these things because like for instance if we just kind of in aggressively pushed back from all technology which my gut is like i'm like want an older car i don't want a smart tv i don't want to go any of that stuff I'm with you. but if we all just break away from it right now they're going to keep building it and we're going to be screwed and we're not going to have any way to get you know communicate and go around yeah it. the amish ain't conquering they're cool yeah, and all yeah, that's a good way you know <laughs> but seriously so i think it's important that we at least begin to like look into ways that this stuff can be pushed back against you know the dec uh, hollow chain is one that i've followed for a while i haven't been looking into it for a while it's another you know blockchain no, it's not blockchain actually but it's a crypto you know discussion for decentralized internet but i know there's a lot of different things out there that it could work and they're pushing back against it you know i think the whole point about the great reset and where all this is going and it's just it's one large but one facet of everything that's happening is it's the technological control i mean Catherine austin fitz will point will, would argue it's much more about the financial control and it's a like a way to build the infrastructure which i agree with but all the technology is leading in this direction you know everything they want to remove your anonymity they want to remove your ability to have a vpn to be able to you know everything they're doing right now you try to w access a main website right now if you have a vpn most of them won't even let you look at the website like why does it even make sense and they're not they're, they, they they want to track you they want to know what you're doing what you're reading what you're thinking it's, it's an alarming time and this is, it's always been there, but I think people are just finally starting to see what a lot of these conspiracy theorists have been waving their arms about for, you know, look at how long Corbett's been talking about this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah. This 2009 video archives, which when he was on the show, I'm like, I have that old DVD. I mean, that's how far, I mean, it goes back even further than that, but yeah. I think the idea here is you have to repurpose the technology because the technology is being sort of rolled out in order to control and enslave us. But we have to find a way to sort of take that energy and sort of transform and transmute it yeah. so we can use it in a way that per participates more in freedom and, you know, galvanizing our own sort of communities to take action that, you yeah. know, around those concepts. So it's, it's yeah. difficult, but that's because to your point, yes, it's, it was about digital, um, financial control and it still is, but yeah, they I want agree. control as Patrick, we had Patrick Wood on a couple of weeks ago and he's talking about, but it's really about technocracy now. It's about transhumanism. Right. That's it's really the end game because it's one in the same. At first it was about financial control because they thought this controlling markets could control the human being, which to some degree does. But now that with the level of technology and the advancement in technology and the pace at which technology is advancing, you're realizing, well, now we want 
granular control. We want to be able to control the human mind, body, soul complex completely. Mm. And that's, you know, it's, it's devastating, but at the same time, I think it gives us the opportunity to maybe find ways to, I don't know, uh, get, use their own technologies, their own concepts against themselves in some capacity. I hope so at least because yeah. like, we're not going to, we still have to participate in the technology because the culture at large is doing so. And that supply chains and our ability to even provide for ourselves. Like we're embedded in this. We have to find a way to sort of sort of deflect and push back. That's yeah. a well, it's an interesting analogy. argument though. And I, I see like, I see both sides of it. And mm-hmm. just because you can see both sides of it doesn't even mean you have to have an opinion on it because I'm continuing to learn about it. So let me just throw out what I'm thinking. Terrible. If we take this argument that adopting, for instance, uh, crypto or blockchain and this type, type of technology that is being developed over here by central banks to control us, right? It might not have originated there, but they have definitely got on the bandwagon over the past five, 10 years. And they're like, they're going to be building and, and make their low pressure area or force people into those corrals and get that done. So because they're doing that, does that mean we can't in, you know, investigate a pirate uh, coin or a Monero or privacy type of transaction using a similar infrastructure, right? right? So that's a question. It's hard to tell. We're in the fog of war on these topics. So let's go back 20 years. The internet was built by DARPA to your 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 point, Ryan. So should we not use the internet because it was created by DARPA and they're going to spy on us and surveil us and build patterns and, and train the AI from the data we feed it over two decades, they can control us, right? Should we not use it to intellectually find out what's going on and communicate with other people before they have total tyranny forever? Okay, but that's still, we're in the fog of war. Let's go back to the telephone. 1970s COINTELPRO, if we use the phone, bro, to talk about freedom, they're going to tag our words and they're going to come take us off to camps. Maybe we shouldn't use the phone. Let's go back to courier pigeons like the Rothschilds and let's do stuff like that and put it in code. No. So use the telephone, use the internet, use this stuff. Know it's a double-edged sword. Know that they're working their butts off and organizing and funding and trying to do this over here. So we need freedom over here. Technology can be availed to have freedom. Like if freedom is going to be had in the future of their technocratic despotism, we're going to need technology equal and opposite of some variety on our side right. to well, keep freedom alight in the future. That, that's the key. It's, it's not, it's about the you, it's about the way in which it's being used, right? Like there's a huge difference there. Like for, take a good example wearables like or implantables let's say which is where it's going like like implanting some device in your arm i'm not suggesting you go out and implant the good device in your arm that's not what i'm saying right that's that's counter that's the opposite what i'm saying is we need to understand how this works and and that wearable implantable part of it is totally off the table for me i'm talking about the idea of you know the technology itself like the idea of the passports the idea of and again not that we should have them but understand how these things operate how they can be circumvented right we don't we don't know how to work around these things if we don't understand them and i think the main focal point is around blockchain <clears throat> i do think that's a central part of where this goes you know the the internet of bodies the 5g smart city kind of thing that all works on the same technology right now anyway and so if we find ways around it how to you know make our own communities around the side of it. Derek's a big proponent of that, right? The, the counter economies, and maybe that involves some new technology, right? I mean, that we just have to be open to these different possibilities. You're saying Richard, I think it's exactly right. And it's, if you're, if you're going to shun yourself from it completely without understanding it, you're, it's just, you're just letting them build the panopticon around you in real time. Yeah. And then the next element would be like dividing and conquering around that topic while it's still open for investigation. And we understand there is an enemy. And there are people that are trying to do stuff. But on the other hand, maybe we need to hook up some IPFS. So Ryan uploads once and it goes to the internet forever. And then it comes down and distributes to these places where people on the regular internet goes, right? And it goes and populates your float and your odyssey and all these different channels. Then you have an indelible publishing system. And if they try to censor you, well, what they can't censor you out here in this interplanetary file sharing system that they created to talk to people on Mars. Right. They're like, how do we send data to Mars if we ever send people? And they created this protocol. Well, we can also use that protocol to make your publishing indelible. Now, not me personally, but smart people we might know that are working on these things and already getting like Corbett stuff up and indelible. This um, is where I need to go. I, I'm, I'm actively looking right now for somebody to help br- kind of bring TLAV into that field because it's new to me. You know, like whether we're talking about Linux or, you know, all these different directions, I'm just like, okay, like I've, you know, I'm, I'm open to it, but it's, it's definitely a, 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 you know, what's the right analogy? Like it just, it's completely new to me. And so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The goal the is learning like, curve. It's tough to, yeah. you know, uh, spend time learning new systems. We do, and I don't have living. the time. 
to learn. Especially right. when we have these shows and everything we do every day. You know, there's a lot that goes into right. like, Jesus, I'm going to have to change this and that and what the plugs and... <laughs> you know? And yeah. there are only things that break you're not aware of because yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm all too familiar with it from work. That's yeah, last do. last night I sat, or two nights ago, I sat down in the other studio behind me to teach the students and like my camera wasn't working. And it's like, I not only have to teach a class and push the buttons for the slides, but I got to make sure the cameras are working. So most of the time around here, it's one man show, but I do have a lot of online help. And so what we did is we delegated and the, the IPFS project for Grand Theft World is going on right now. It started last week with Patrick Sheehan and he started, uh, so he had a meeting. So anyway, we've been having R and D meetings for like two years on this topic, but now we have a way where it's actually a method and there's some programming and it goes up and comes down and then it gets spread all over the place. And, uh, yeah, you need that too, dude. And yeah, you can maybe, only maybe you can we talk offline, give me some insight because I'm definitely yeah, you can only to. wear so many hats. So let's get you wearing the, the hats you wear best and figure out how to like systematize, delegate the rest. Right. Because right. you know, Sounds we don't want to get you burned out. <laughs> now, Corbett, on the other hand, amazing consistency over the years. So yeah, he's the one that got me to start taking it seriously. So I was podcasting probably for a year. Um, he started his podcast 2007. And then I was like, holy shit. It wasn't just like Alex Jones who doesn't communicate with anybody. I'm like, there's this guy I can write to. There's yeah. this guy, there's another guy over there and he's publishing Because he's too. a real person. <laughs> yeah, he's a real person. And he's been the same real person since I've known him in 2007 yeah. or maybe 2008 at the latest. But right. him and Pilato were like some of the first yeah. people that I met. And James Evan Pilato is also awesomely consistent. And like, yeah. He was Good doing guy. his radio show actually first before any of us. He's he started like 2003. Yeah, he he's a classic radio guy, man. I love James. Oh, dude, he's, a, <laughs> he's a deep catalog of knowledge, that dude, right? Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. And he grew up in West Virginia and like a lot of people in West Virginia, you know, who might not leave or feel sorry for themselves or victim mentality. He took it upon himself to go beyond public schooling and all these other things. And that's why he's like an original character who's out there like living, living his dream. Like mm -hmm. he's, he's happily married from what I know. And he does something consistently that feeds his passion, but also his curiosity and his interest. And it, he packages it. So it brings value to other people. And when he and Corbett started like new world next week, mm -hmm. that's like five or six years into this. Uh, I was like, okay, well, you know, this is cool. And now it's like, they're on episode 1000 something or other. I'm sure at this point, and it's like, I love it. that just that, that little simple, like, cause I'm like, oh, I see what they're doing. They're having a call once a week and they're talking about some stories. But right. it became a thing, right? And now it's a thing that we all kind of jones for. It's like, is it out yet? Can we see it? What's going right. on? <laughs> right. I love it. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I want to see you grow. I want to see you flourish. I see you really out there working hard. I see you like up against like the natural forces of the environment. But there's like, you know, uh, just the daily, you got to think of something. You got to put it on screen. You got to record it. You got to edit it. You got to post it. You got to publish it. All these sort of things that think people don't people, think about. Well, they don't. They they yeah. click on Rockfin. They see your stuff. They oh, give you a little yeah. tip, and then they're split. That's about you know. But they don't see that before and after. You got hours of work to get that done. Well, so people don't uh, recognize that it. Well, and I get it. Before I did this too, you know, you don't really understand what goes into it. But the people really genuinely think that we just sit down and hit a button. And and I'm serious. Like, and they, no, they, you're they, right. They go, Why 100%. couldn't we just add this or add the more links than this or put it in this category? And it's like, well, I've added to the list, man. There's a hundred thousand <laughs> things I could do. <clears throat> to the point I was saying earlier, I actually think I strayed off on it's it, in regard to the show. There's nobody else back here. There's nobody helping with links. I other, other than the people that send them to me from, you know, people out in the community, you know, I, so I should say there's a lot of people that send me research, but that almost becomes counterintuitive after a minute when you have, you know, 75 emails every five minutes that are <laughs> look at this, look at this, but it's impossible but it's, to process. Though, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's really, it can be in, insurmountable. I, yeah, again. I, I experienced the same thing when I took over the GTW show card. It was where you, we get feedback from the community, but at this, Rich would say like I was making the show call show card into like essentially his Christmas list when he was five years old. Dude, and I'm like, like, okay, so, on. I was know, like, there's no way. And I was organizing <laughs> it, and I was trying to watch as much as I could. And I'm like, after six months, I'm like, called a meeting. I'm like, yeah, we gotta rethink this. No, but, well, you know, I, it, I, it's, it's, it's I, triage. I mean, that's really what yeah. it is. I mean, I, I, I hate to say this, but this is just the simple reality of what it is, is there's there it's, you have to basically decide what you're not going to look at or get to. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. Unless you're going to hire somebody to go through this, which, you know, which I am to some degree, like I'm bringing people in to help go through it, but I'm such a, I'm so neurotic about letting people in the bubble. You know what I mean? Like knowing things or seeing what's coming through. And you know, these days it's hard to let people inside, you know? Yeah. 
No, I agree yeah, with that. and going back to that point about Tony's Christmas list uh, <clears throat> show card. When I first interviewed John Taylor Gatto, I, I took him. Oh to the, yes. I took him to the hotel the night before. I picked him up at the airport, took him to the hotel, and I said, "Here's my outline. This is what I'd like to talk about this weekend." He comes back to me the next morning, and so we turn on the lights. We're about to film, and he goes about the outline. He goes, "Richard." If we had all week, we couldn't cover this outline. And that's a point I just set it aside. And we had like a kinetic conversation for the next two days based on that. But yeah, I, I've been where Tony was with, we got to talk about all this stuff. He's like, no, we got to find the best things to build out, to right. give the message to the audience so that they can have handles on it and hand it to other people. Is well, kind you of feel like, like you owe them to a degree, you know, it's like, well, they reached out, they took the time to write three paragraphs about why this is important, you know, and it's like, you feel like you're letting them down. I, you know what, you know, what eats away at me is that I, there are people every day that reach out that we don't respond to. And I, I mean, there was a moment where, you know, whether it's one thing we, I, I really, really make sure that we do T lab and I'm not the only one that does this just to be honest about that is that we respond to people that write us. We get a lot of written mail and, and we respond to every single one of them, handwritten, everything. But in regard to the emails, which are so much more, it's like there was a, po a period in time where I was responding to every single thing. And I was every day getting all the emails down to zero. And there got to a point to where you just start going, OK, shoot, there's 10 more. I'll give them to them tomorrow. Next day, oh, there's 30. OK, I'll just get it to tomorrow. And then again, the point is, well, at some point you're like, well, shoot, now it's a thousand. It's like. Yeah, it becomes it, exponential. It's zero is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> you just kind of move forward. And it's like, it breaks my heart is the point though. Yeah. They, yeah. They, it means it, so much to them and it should. I saw that happen to Corbett first because he said, look, I'm getting too many emails and I can't write back to him. And I was like, oh, look at him. I said, I still get enough emails. I can write back to all of them. But at some point I'm going to get to the point that he's at. And then I did. And then I do. I carry that weight. And, yeah. and now since I turned on comments on YouTube, since I started this podcast, because for years, for like, you know, 10 years, I didn't have comments on YouTube. And for 10 years, I didn't have a cell phone either. Those were peaceful years. Yes. Now I don't read I the comments that. on YouTube. Sid Rock, one of the autonomy graduates. That's one of the things he gets paid to do every week. The people who have in serious inquiries, make sure they get to me in some meeting or, you know, and they mm -hmm. want a link and send it to them because I don't have the time in my schedule to do that thing, but I feel it needs to be done. So I will pay somebody who I've trained uh, with excellence to do that sort of thing and be my proxy. And that's a load off. I haven't done it for my email yet, but I did do it for like the social media type stuff. Yeah. So well, it's good, man. I mean, it just shows that you care about what they're saying. For me, the comments part of it have, have other than my website, I don't really and get unless one just happens to catch my eye, which usually it happens to be a bad one because I hate that that's the one I've, you know, but you know, you, I just respond to the, the website and leave the rest alone because so much of the engagement on YouTube and everything else becomes so vitriolic and so negative and especially Twitter. It's just, Man, every single time I get cooked into responding on Twitter, I I regret it every single time. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Negative. I might respond on Twitter once or twice a month. I try yeah. to stay away from that. And I also, because I, I learned that from um, the, the reason I didn't have YouTube comments on wasn't to avoid trolls. I just felt it was disingenuous for people to leave me comments there thinking I'm going to go there and read them and respond when I'm, I'm busy reading and responding what members are asking me. These people have paid for my time. They get my time first and I don't really have time. So, you know, it's a, uh, I see like, I want to serve them and like answer their questions and do all these things. But I also have outlets where I do these things and people who really want to get in touch with me, they seem to find their way through. Well, see, so that's the point. That's the point. Anybody yeah. that really wants, the, I mean, you're, I'm, I assume your emails posted somewhere very clearly, right? <laughs> if somebody somewhere, really yeah. wanted to get to you, they would go that way. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. You get those emails sometimes where it's like, you know, I, you know, I left all these, I can't believe you didn't respond to me. And it's like, come on, really? Like then I feel even worse. Cause it's like, you know, they, they, most people are more than aware that we're, that it's just, they know that you're busy. Like nobody really understands thinks you're going to respond on a YouTube comment. Most people, they really don't think that, you know, it's the ones that think that you're the only kind and because they posted, they know you saw it, which is not really the truth. You know, it's just too bad. But the point is that this goes to such a point where, you know, it's a good problem. You know, it, I mean, it look, look at how many people you're reaching on a daily basis. You know, that's what they don't want us to see. That's why I think that the effort is to kind of keep this, the moment that you start reaching enough and you start, you know, it's, it's really dangerous for them to allow that to continue. Like the Patreon point, that's the same thing that was uh, the response to Whitney as well as me. They basically admitted that you're allowed to have these conversations, but you can't prove them. Essentially, they didn't use the word prove but they pointed the links. Okay. Well, you're pointing at source material, like peer reviewed science. Okay. So that we prove that we're right. And now it's fake news. Perfect. 
you know, so that's exactly the point. So they just can't let that reach get out. You know, shows what was like- that? Was, is that two years ago? The Patreon, Ooh, Patreon banning? No, probably less than two years. I don't know. It kind of bleeds together, but it was, it was a while ago. It's like a year and a half year ago or something like yeah. that. Cause I remember when it happened and I, I was, I thought I was a part of the show. Well, I remember seeing a bunch of people it's been with, a year. with Patreon loss at the time. And one of the things was, it wasn't even something that was posted on Patreon. It was something right. somebody had posted on another site. Both of us. That they're like, yeah. you posted that this thing over here, and you, you know, because I wasn't sure if that was yours or Whitney's yeah. situation or both. Or but my mine was my website, hers was Unlimited Hangout, and they right. basically they both they basically just said here you have to delete these articles that you posted that have nothing to do with Patreon, other than that you posted the link on Patreon. Like that's just incredible. I mean, but that's beginning to happen everywhere now. Even Getter, by the way, did you see that Getter no. censored me? Yeah, very clearly. And then censored somebody else. And he even re- he was a bigger, bigger, bigger entity. And he reached out to them. And I don't think they realized. I don't know if it's illegal that he did this or not, but he, you know, caught he, they responded. He showed the response and they said it's based on your actions off the platform. I was oh, like, oh, my God, this platform is pretending to be free speech. I mean, it's just this is gross. There's a lot of these happening out there. We need to be skeptical about all of these platforms, whether Gab or anything else. I mean, I'm not trying to say that we should immediately assume that they're trying to you know, lie to you, but. I don't know. A lot of these, like, like Rumble is a good example. I am very suspicious of Rumble for a thousand different reasons. If you oh, get yeah. into, if you'd like to, but I think it's just the new YouTube. That they're just yeah, I mean, the new um, YouTube. They're trying to compete in that market. So Getter, I thought they went public recently. But, Getter, yeah. I've got a profile, but after I created I the profile, I was like, uh, who are these guys? And I was like, headquarters, Columbus Circle, New York City. I was like, that's really expensive real estate to be running your HQ out of. Who's the guy? Oh, it's a guy that used to work in like Trump administration. Now yeah. he's doing, oh, okay, I see what it is done yep. pretty much with control opposition but, sort of but thing. on the well, other they, they hand respond to me oh good yeah i was gonna say like um jeremy from library right or right. kingsley and aaron from float like there are platforms where we can actually know and, yeah. and talk to the people creating it or both of those platforms right so uh rock fan i've talked to some nice people at rock fan too i love rock fan yeah but you know uh there are a couple other platforms like this and between this there's been a huge gushing of freedom in the past two years that otherwise would have just been on YouTube and you right. see when YouTube censored everybody, what was it? 20, 2017. I did a talk at the porcupine freedom festival on how creators like us needed to have our own platforms. Cause they were going to come by and censor and demonetize and do all the stuff that they've done since then. So the, the, the gist was um, there's two things when YouTube bans you and takes away your income, you just lost. But in reality, if you can land on your feet, have your own platform, your own offer, connect with your audience directly, own those contacts and not have them knowing who your audience is, right? Right. That's great for you. And by the way, YouTube just lost control of your attention and everyone in your audience's attention. And if they can do that to enough of the creators, we would all be over here with independent platforms, probably federated, cross-pollinating information. And uh, it's not the uh, Fediverse that they talk about on the Timcast. But this is just over here now because you decided to cut ties. Twitter and YouTube and these places want to block and censor. And now there's a whole group of people over here. And the conversation is really over here because over here, everyone knows it's like the, the cookie cutter, milk toast, talking points from the administration and the people in power. Right. Yeah. I think that's going on right now. I agree. I, I th- that's that's exactly the idea of having these kind of counter economies, counter societies like around it all. I mean, look, I wouldn't even be posting on soup on YouTube or using it all, even at all, if it wasn't that there was the largest grouping of people that are still lost. That right? need to I mean, be that's saved. The idea. What's that? That need to be saved, and we don't save yes, them. But the exactly. information we're kind of putting through the the media mirror here is things they could use to think about to save themselves. And the problem here, and I shouldn't say the problem, but the confusion is that people are like, well, you're still, you know, you're, you're telling us to stop using YouTube, but you're putting it on YouTube. And it's like, well, see, the point is that our job is not to high five about how we know what's going on. It's about, you know, we're doing this, hopefully everybody right. in this field to reach those people over there that are confused, that are lost, that are being misled. The problem is that, again, the, the, the confusion is that those people that don't do a show like this, they should be the ones going anywhere but YouTube because they don't really need to be on YouTube. They're the ones staying, not, and again, not to be accusatory, like I get why it's, it's easier, but they get used to the chat right? They like the way it's functional. It's on their phone, you know? So it's about getting rid of these little comforts, you know, it's yeah. like, like during COVID-19, it was like, well, we need to stand up against all of this, except I still like my Frappuccino. So I'm going to go to the Starbucks every day. It's like, well, no, see, you need to put your foot down and be like, those creature comforts got to go because it's more important than that. 
You That's know? what bothers me because I'm afraid what happens if YouTube goes after our customer, like I want to say customer base and people who frequent our community. And then it's like, you know, because they like they want to have one foot in both worlds. A lot of these individuals, and I get why, because of the convenience. A lot of it does come down to convenience, especially with how it integrates with other devices like our smartphone and so forth and so on that. You know, I you know that would be the next step. I'd hate to say, don't. Hopefully, no one's listening to this of the technocracy yeah. sphere. But, right. <laughs> but well, this, I mean, here's, you a good, know. here's a good example. Go I, I use it often for the transcript because mm -hmm. no oh, other platform yeah. has it, right? So it's like I often open YouTube to grab the transcript and search for things, even though they know. I guess I don't should say know that, but it only works if I have it on a private window. I don't get go down that rabbit hole. Every the thousand things that don't work on YouTube for me these days, I think it's pretty funny. The algorithm's but, very sophisticated too for finding like like videos, just at least for if you're just looking for base entertainment or something really like good that. At so stuff too. It's really good at hiding yeah. stuff. I it's, look for my own but stuff it also, not only like, publicly, but, but in my control panel, and it won't show it to me sometimes. And I'm typing in like the exact title or whatever, right. and it'll show me anyone else who has published or copied my video and pub published it. Right. But it won't like list my publishing of that thing, which is pretty band. epic. Yeah. yeah I mean, that, like that, that's, that, that's what I just showed on my, I was just searching for uh, an article that Derek wrote. Cause I was looking for the link to put it in. And I read at like an, an endless list of, other sites that I've never heard of, like real small sites I've never heard of, you know, but the same exact title, all those came up and Axis Post was the first one, which I'm glad because Axis Post, I, I like Axis Post, but because they repost a lot of our work, but I'm like, I search for the exact title. Unless you type in the full name, Last American Vagabond, it doesn't even come up like page 17. It's not there. Like, yeah, they have there's no the way best. you understand that. They have the best query system somehow because you go to Rumble, unless you type in the exact thing you want, you won't not find it. Their query system is terrible and Odyssey is not much better. But yet, like I know, I know YouTube's is very good, except that they shadow ban because right. you can find anything else you want by just typing in some sort of incoherent sort of oxymoronic phrases. But then all of a sudden, if you want to, so you know what you want to search for, like, I don't know, the James Corbett's oh, like here's 9 an example. conspiracy I got, I got one five from yesterday. Video. Can't find yeah. that. So, like, I was yeah. trying to find DOSNet. Oh by, yeah, that took right? me a while to find again, and I downloaded. Okay, so I went. I went. I was trying to send it to Vedmore. Uh, I went to Bitshoot. No, nothing found. I went to Odyssey. No results found. Hmm. Okay, let me try YouTube. Oh, the net. Here it is. Here's a documentary. Let's damn back. Here it is. Here's the whole thing. So even though they've censored it, the original versions, they they allow uploading of pirate versions on there still. So there's still like a beauty of freedom that exists within <laughs> the tyranny of YouTube out there. It's pirate channels, yeah. pirate uploads. And right. these sort of things that but are I slipping think through. That. I think so, eventually they're going to do yeah, something about they, that. Yeah. Like they, it's, but Penalize I also think, your social credit score, of course. Exactly. But I also think it has something to do with the influence. That's my point from before. That mm. if, it, if it's not reaching enough people, they don't really care. You know, it's like this guy's That's got three point. views. It's got four, you know, 40 people subscribed. Once it like, let's say somebody grabs it and it goes somewhere else. You know, it's just about the reach, bottom line. You know, and that's why if they feel they've censored our work, I can't pull it and air it on my own channel, you know, and reach those people. So it's like, they're kind of box it out. They put it in that corner and then they'll frame that corner as the extremist corner. All the maniacs over here talking about this topic, you know, they, they create that perception, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but I, I think that it always comes back to promoting and, and leaning into the, the platforms that we know will support us. By the way, I don't know if you guys have seen super you, I think that's another, uh, that's one that I'm really working with lately that I think is a great platform, superu.net. It's, it's the only one out there, in my opinion, that is all it's got all the other bells and whistles that YouTube currently has, like the embeds, live streaming, you know, video on demand. Like it's, it's another video streaming platform. It's not just like a Twitter, Facebook with video. You know what I mean? Because some yeah. of these newer ones are still kind of trying. I mean, even even like a, a bit shoot does still doesn't have live streaming, you know, yeah. or, or Odyssey doesn't have all the other things that YouTube does. Like Super U is really striving to be like, you know, a, a YouTube alternative in a good way. And I know the people that built it. You know, at least from my perspective, I know that at least where we're at now, that they believe in maintaining the, the, the merits, the, the tenets of protecting the people that are speaking the truth. Bottom line, you know, but I, I yeah. for instance, I know BitChute and Odyssey are the same way, though. Like, I, I love that they're standing up for their creators. Yeah, and I think the pressure that's being exerted by the people of the ilk of the World Government Summit, you know, they're they're exerting pressure and they're not doing it on purpose. This is like a, a, a like on. Uh, predicted reaction because there's the predictable reaction those are all the people that just snap in line and say yes please to the new thing right but there's other people that are going to want to drag their feet and they have some plans for us but it hasn't kicked in yet so we still got freedom we can still communicate pretty freely right now it's going to go up other people are going to be able to see this so i think i'm very optimistic even though it's like 
this is the <clears throat> act three in the play and we're getting close to the end and the dollar's about dead and it's not a good time in, in history for the world enter you know uh world war three and putin and ukraine and this whole sort of thing to kick off and uh while they work on covid two electric boogaloo yeah, right right it's coming because they're still going with the, the commons pass and all these things that they designed just because it went away right now doesn't mean they're going to stop any of this infrastructure it's going full steam ahead behind the scenes while people are watching the slap heard around the world it didn't go away yeah exactly yeah. exactly but that's a, the main point is it didn't go away like right. that's the real point the narrative stopped everything in fact kept going and that the digital id i just pointed this out in the last show i mean <clears throat> the digital all they really did is stop centralizing the narrative around COVID. They're like, well, here's you a digital ID for your safety, right. for international travel. It's like, well, wait a minute. It's the exact same thing. All you need to do is include the COVID pass in there. With the, it, You don't even need to change anything on the technological side. It's just narrative, you know? It's rebranding, new narrative. It's, yeah, I mean, exactly. that's, that's Rich asked me last week, what do you think, what are you most concerned about with the next week's narrative? And I said, what they're not talking about in regards to COVID, because they're not letting that go. That's really the, right. how they're going to usher in this sort of technocratic control global control grid and like they're not stopping that the, the billions of dollars have been invested worldwide is not going to just all of a sudden go away because we're focused on either ukraine or then what happened after we finished the show rich immediately sends us like four in the morning oh the slap heard around the world and that's all i have a whole section on that not that we'll probably even get to it but it's just like that was huge the culture section was massive this week between the whole trans transgenderism you know the cultural marxism sort of nonsense going on or critical theory but then also the slap and you know the silencing of of uh, comedians i mean it's just it's weird because for the past i've been now part of the show about a year and since i've been doing the show card about nine ten months the vac i call it the vaccines uh lockdowns therapeutic section basically the COVID 19 section mm -hmm. was massive and we, that would be what would take up three, four hours of the show at least. Right. All of a sudden, it's it's dwindled. The past couple of weeks, it's it's dwindled down to be nothing. Even Ukraine this week was not like big for the compared to the past couple of weeks. And all of a sudden, this culture section just took off. And I'm like, you can kind of see is the way I'm building this, or I'm sure you see this when you do your daily breakdowns, like yeah. how the narrative is being crafted and framed. Who, what are people talking about? And you sort right. of get like a meta viewpoint of oh, I see. I can now see it from like a, a sort of outside the the sphere perspective, of like what's going on inside the sphere, and it's yeah, it's well, weird. What, what you're what you're kind of encapsulating there is the is the the mainstream you know yes. wind bubble of discussion. You know, like because so, really, as I know you know, there's the the real conversation, and this is what's frustrating me is that <laughs> like I'm getting to the same point where I'm like, okay, dang it, I know that COVID is obviously like they just admitted this is happening. They just pointed out this is happening. Oh my God. They just said this doesn't work. And there's all these things coming out left and right. And then you're like, but 90% of my show is about Ukraine. You're like, because right, it has you to got be. it. Yes. Yeah. And it's so frustrating, but, but you, I, the point I keep making is it's like in this moment today, in this show, that's gotta be the focus, but realize all of this is interconnected, you know, and, and whether it's the Ukraine literally being connected to the COVID-19 narrative via the bio labs and the foreign policy and the white, you know, vanilla isis and the white supremacist domestic terrorism biological threats like you can see how this kind of wraps in together but on top of that there's a lot of other things around it as well like the the the, the i mean we, we can since you brought it up i mean i don't get, i never talk about this stuff on my show like i even made a point to kind of laugh about that topic because it's obviously being used to manipulate people but there's interesting discussions around it like if you really yeah. want to just have like a pop culture conversation I, there, I I validly was like from a cultural perspective fake. maybe this it's, was planned <laughs> you know, yeah you yeah can't prove that exactly or just no it, but you have to consider it like I, I don't necessarily oh. fall down on that side of the argument either but you have to consider it because it was coming into it sponsored by Pfizer it was coming mm -hmm. into it low in ratings you're talking about an academy award winning actor getting like you know getting this Oscar tonight he's got a front row seat if they had worked it out now, I know Chris Pry didn't write the joke and I know they didn't rehearse that apparently in public at the mm -hmm. scheduled rehearsals, but it still could have been a thing. And in the movies all the time, people are trained to slap really close and react to it. And Chris did have his hands behind his back and yeah, kind of lean weird. into it. It looks but like he also, as you do in movies or in wrestling, you know, you sort of. You, but you Chris also makes a punch. fist afterwards. If you look the if you look at the still frames, okay. first off, the best meme was rock, uh, rock uh, beat uh, paper beats rock. Because his uh, Will Smith's hand was open. 
So paper beats rock. And then there's one where they're like, Chris Rock was about to hit him back. Look, he makes a fist. And if you look at his fist, his thumbs on the inside of his fist, which tells me he hasn't been taught how to fight. So it wasn't going to go well. So he opted out of that. So I could see it being a legitimate surprise and an honorable kind of like Will Smith Smith just slapped the shit out of me reacting to it and i can also see it the other way and i don't have to have an opinion either way and make a decision because i don't think we have enough information to make a decision exactly. on that i agree and they 100%. get people to jump to conclusions all the right. time either by censoring by national security or by not by not showing us what's on stage left right above the stage uh, underneath the stage backstage yeah or, or just we used to really think about how these things can happen like you could stick like there's usually a, an event or a moment, you know, there's something that happens. So in this case, the slap or whatever, you know, that that's the moment. If you, then you build out from there and you go, okay, what can I find? Oh, Pfizer. Oh, alopecia. Oh, they have a drug. And you start, you know, piecing these things together. You can do that with things that aren't actually the real story. Like you could take an event, look back at it, and we could like pick an idea and then research from that point. It's called confirmation bias, right? You yeah. will find things that fit together. And and sometimes it's pretty compelling. Sometimes it's a little bit stretchy, like, you know, like QAnon stuff where you're like, well, this guy has red hair. So therefore he's the guy, you know, like that's kind of <laughs> the stuff that that's the, the reason. That's like non sequiturs, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, it's like, there was some weird stuff. I mean, the connection to alopecia and Pfizer and the whole thing, but I, you could make the point that Pfizer funds like damn near everything we're looking that's the thing right yeah that alopecia is pretty you know this large segment does suffer from that so i mean like you can you can find other counter narratives of like pushback against that a little bit and the pattern this is the pattern is the fallacy the confirmation bias apophenia all these different terms i think the real if we find the patterns we want then we fit them into the narrative that we think provides a sort of causative stream right. of and information it right. but it's, it could but that yeah. you know just because it could doesn't mean there's enough information exactly that and that's yeah. what you just said that's where answer, you need yeah. to end up you're like well you know we where we don't have enough information that's the problem with today. and that's a decision there where yes. it's okay to say that it's okay yes. to say that yes that's exactly yeah. what i was going to say and it's yeah. it's so important to really hear this people it's like we have to be okay to be like i don't know Yes. And that has to be okay forever. If you don't have enough information, you don't just choose to pick a side. That's what we're told we should do today. Oh, the authority said, therefore, you're dumb for not going along with this. You know, it's we're, we're being engineered. I, I teach logic, and that was a big segment I had on my recent course I was do on Thursdays. So I was like, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's the fallacy right. of adding your anti. Just because something's possible doesn't mean there's enough evidence in the positive that people have asserted that there's enough evidence that you can make that positive assertion that that thing actually exists. Mm, yeah. no like it's okay to say i don't know it's also okay to say no the negative holds the field if there's not enough evidence it's okay right. to like stand your ground have conviction have confidence in standing your ground when there's not enough evidence presented to you you should hear all the sides and you should, you should consider all the evidence if you have the time to do so for whatever you're interested in consider a value but don't just jump into whatever someone wants you to believe yeah um, so whether or not the, the slap was fake or not not enough information to make Correct. that determination at this time. And do right. we need to look more into it? No, it doesn't no. matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. However, <laughs> however, I did get too much information about the entanglements in this August. What's his name? The 20 yeah. year old dude who's friends with her son. And that's who she slept. I got too much yeah. information about that, the man. family Smith. And then I found out they had round tables where they had talked about this. And yeah. then I found, the I found that happening. I found the Ryan Long video from three months ago, a message to Will Smith, which we'll play toward the end of the show because it's a little more adulty. But if you just see, like, I didn't have any idea the cultural milieu, which was surrounding Will Smith at the time. And then oh, it's see, been going like, on for a year plus. Yeah. yeah like, it's I've just loved, strange. Yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, like, the fact that these conversations are being had at a legit, like, at a legitimate me- Oprah level, level Oprah absurd. type level. Yeah. <laughs> it's so silly. Like, I mean, like, and I, like, for instance, my, my, somebody, well, somebody close in my inner circle <laughs> was, was like waxing intellectual about this to somebody else in my inner circle. And it's just like, cause I, I'm sitting here laughing about this concept. Oh, did you hear? Did you hear that his son did this? And it's like, this is the person that was 30 seconds ago, like, invested in whether or not russia was Tears. Gonna, now they're talking about will smith and he's coming down <laughs> yeah. it's like but just think about how ridiculous that is so yeah. you, you, you're in his mind this is the same level of news as 30 seconds ago whether russia was going to start world war three the yeah. fact that whether this person had some reason to slap this other person like yeah. my god they, the point is they're batting at the new dangly cat toy they put in front of them and that's what they yeah. think they're supposed to be doing the fracturing of consciousness and then people can't pay attention sit down and pay attention do what you do obviously so well and what we ch- attempt to do as well on these long form shows is you know give a sort of long narrative where you have to sit down you have to pay attention you have to invest yourself and your time to actually sort of extricate meaning from it and it does it takes a sort of reorganizing of your own mind and sort of what you consider to be valuable and also some sort of uh 
you know, Joe Rogan sort of showed that a little bit. I know it's mainstream, but at least he showed that you can still have a long form discussion with someone and yeah. people will sit down and listen to it if they find it interesting and of value. So it's like, that's where we need to bridge that gap for topics that are a little bit more enigmatic, which I would, I think I, did I a good job of that. Well, I would even argue that, that, that we get, thank you for that. I, I would mm-hmm. even argue that we get, I would, it's possible that most people would, with the, the broader audience would appreciate a longer show and that we get kind of yeah. like shouted down from that. You know, like, because here's the funny part is I get people and again, I think they're maybe starving how part. you only look at the negative, like that stands out more. I hear people go, mm-hmm. oh, it's too long. It's too long. And I, and I, that, I, I internalize that more than anything else, unfortunately. And so then I think about the longer part of the show. But when I do a short show, it gets exponentially less engagement. So it, are they are they wrong? I think most people like the longer shows. And maybe we're being maybe there's a reason there's some sort of an agenda to stop us from doing that because it makes the most impact. Just a thought. Yeah, no. And a lot of times I think people say it's too long, but that's, I mean, this is a little bit of the genetic fallacy, but I sometimes think that it might be related to the content we, we, Mm -hmm. we go over. It's, it's hard to have to say, if you're not someone who's really steeled in your mind and your disposition to deal with the influx of the type of information we're dealing with, it can be extremely difficult. It can be extremely sort of like soul torturing, if you will, Mm -hmm. in regards to the information that's being covered. I understand that because for the years when I worked for Rich for many, many years ago, and I was living with them every day, waking up and inundating yourself with this sort of like torrential rain of information that just is coming from all angles about how you're just being, excuse my language, fucked every possible way. And it's just like, okay, like I, I can now deal with it because I've, I've dealt with it for the past 10 years. I've sort of, uh, sort of steeled myself against it, developed the disposition that can handle it, dealt with my own psychological demons as much as I could to handle that and have you a better framing and, and perspective. Now. It took a yeah. long time though. I mean, that's you're not easy for a lot of people that aren't, that's the you know, difference. Yeah, but it's it's on. I I feel empathy because I went through what I think a lot of people yeah. go through when they're just waking up. Oh, to yeah, this because I went through. I knew you did too. I mean, it's not that yeah. we didn't, but sometimes I think we can not forget. But we're so we're so focused myopically on sort of moving forward that we sort of. I sometimes have to pull myself out quietly and say, "Remember what they're probably going through." I get messages right. from people in the community. Um, luckily, I'm able to respond to most, but some of them I can tell like they're kind of on the edge of their seat and they don't know how to find balance. And I don't, mm-hmm. I give them my perspective. I try to help them through it, but it's, it's not always easy because it's going to be different for every person. I can give them sort of a general like process or flow they can consider, but you know, we all have different sort of passions. It's designed to be uncomfortable. I mean, it's, it's cognitive dissonance. It's, it, there's a lot of different po- ways of this, this works out, but people are, it's, it is a wildly uncomfortable process to come yeah. to a point to where you are literally confronting two different thoughts that don't make sense. And your, your entire worldview is foundationally built on this concept. Like, you know, whether you trust them or you should trust these people, like it's hard. I mean, we have to, it is not something we should, you know, look at and dismiss like you're saying. I mean, it's a, it is a grueling process and people that will push through it deserve our respect. You know, yes. like that's the point about what you guys are doing every day. I mean, this is a hard grueling process that wears on you that's why i I've, i mean you guys have probably seen it yourselves i've worked with people over the years that come into this hot ready to i'm gonna work i'm gonna pump this out and about three months later they're like i can't do this anymore i can't sleep i can't you know and and honestly the, the one that stands with me the most was somebody that was doing this with me back when it was really focused around like pizza gate and some really dark terrible yeah. stuff you know yeah. and and they just can't do it anymore and i i, th- I don't know if that means that we're made for this in a particular way to where because like i gotta be honest i care about this stuff more than most people i know i don't mean care like i want to talk about it like it it pains me to watch what's happening to people in yemen to watch what's happening to children trafficked in different locations like it breaks my heart you know and i care about it but i'm able to disconnect from it i can break away at the end of the day you know lay down with my dog and watch tv you know whatever it is and somehow i'm able to differentiate that i've been doing this for years but some people just can't and they just they just kind of break Well, I think the other thing that adds to the frustration that we experience is the fact that the people who are paid to do something about these things are the ones usually doing the things, right? Right. So it's, it's like, as adults, we should be able to pursue our life and do the things we want, but we can't, we can't right now because these other people are doing these other things that precipitate down to corrosively, uh, abusing and and like just deteriorating our freedom. Yeah. And it's been so hard fought and won over the past couple hundred years of philosophical thoughts to independent actions to actually, uh, you know, sequester some freedom. 
yeah, it's it's been getting spent really fast and we're almost out of it and we're going to need to renew it. And that's not an the easy greatest political philosophic achievement in history in less than 200 years, completely overturned and inverted as quickly. And not as because possible. it was broken, but because it worked so well, they had to undermine it. It worked so well. It took them over 109 years to undermine it, even with their best laid plans and almost total cooperation from the public. Just think about what can happen if we drag our feet and get educated a little bit. Right. And to Ryan's other point, there's a Plato quote. They deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth from Plato's Republic. Mm -hmm. But that's also, that's also the, the motto of an organization that gave you an award for integrity and journalism. Can you talk about that? Well, Serena Shim. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, <clears throat> I'm honored to, to be, to accept that award. That's I a mean, good list. I know a lot of yeah. those, the people on that list, you know, and it just, it's a list of people that are just willing to to speak up for those who don't have a voice, you know, and that's really what it comes down to, you know, the story, Shirina Shim in general, or any number, I, you know, the, the sad reality is there's an endless list of stories like that coming from the Israeli side of this, or, you know, like, like looking at the, I'm blank on her name all of a sudden in regard to the you probably you might remember the woman's name there that got run over by the bulldozer she was a big case that you know you remember that one i i, I don't want to i don't want to get off but i can't remember her name the audience will probably know i'm sad that i forgot it but it was a woman that was out there protesting and was standing in front of the bulldozer about ready to take over somebody's home that they, they you know are being forced to leave and they ran right over her murdered her right in front of everybody and they acted like it was a mistake with the rule. I mean, it's just, that's the kind of stuff they used to be able to get away with. It's not the same way today, you know? So I, the, the award is being given to people that are willing to, you know, put their, put themselves out there. And of course the sad reality is that it's being framed as like a, like, because we got that award, we're like Assad stooges or something, sure, or, yeah. or whatever it is, like whatever, you know, cause right. A lot of the Serena Shim awards focused around Syria and has been for a while, you know, but it's, it's about anything really, but yeah, I, I'm honored. And I, I think that's a great group of people honored to be part of it. Yeah, it's um, I think more awards should be given out for integrity and journalism. And I, I thought that, you know, uh, when I look through the list, it's like uh, Gareth Porter. There's a lot of people that do really serious investigative journalism and they're not they're not uh, not even worshipped. They're not even respected by a lot of like the establishment They're like they're very much on the fringe and that's why they have good because they're doing real opinion. journalism yeah, right right exactly right. <laughs> look at right. so they're always kept off Bealey. you know these, yeah. these people i reference them all the time because in my opinion there are some of the most honest hard-working legitimate investigative journalists in existence today you know there's a lot of people out there that kind of dance that kind of quasi mainstream line and i don't fault them for it i mean people have their own agendas whether you know like in my opinion for what i'm doing i i would sack i would counter my profit model if it meant doing the right thing or making sure the truth went out maybe that sounds uh, uh, um, lofty and naive to some people but that's i mean if we can't be better than them if we can't like draw that line today especially then i don't know what we're here doing you know what we I mean? have to like, have principles i mean the yeah. one thing i think that COVID 19 has taught me and i'm sure we can all relate to this for friends and family is those who sort of have fox principles they they, they wear it on their sleeve but then when something goes wrong and they compromises their you know, uh, relationship with their wife or their coworkers or their extended family, they'll capitulate to anything. And it's like, no, we got to draw the line somewhere and understand that we have principles, we have morals, we're not going to deal with this. And it's like, it doesn't mean we're not going to be friends in some capacity, but I mean, I'm going to set a boundary up around this and say, look, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to, based on the information that's available in regards to the vaccine or what's going on with COVID-19 as, as a disease, or, or you know, just got to have some, some, idea of self-worth and agency and value to the individual and like stand for that stand our ground in some capacity for that i think that's just so important and people sort and of those are all the things you forgetting have about yes if you wanted to work at cnn or msnbc all or fox them. or one of those places you got to acquiesce all that stuff become Anybody the talking head who authoritatively reads the teleprompter yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> and they're not writing their own scripts at those places most people sure. like you know i don't think tucker's Moore. writing his monologue yeah, seriously. Talk to Allison Morrow. She's somebody I've recently, uh, yeah. she, she's doing a great job on Rockfin, you know, and she, anybody that breaks away and like legitimately breaks away and it's like, look at, I just came from there. Here's what I'm willing to tell you. They tell you the same story. Yeah. They don't think for themselves. They're told what they can say They, you know, and the moment she tried to be like, that's not accurate. Like, boop, kick her out. Can't talk about that story anymore. You know, that's the it's gist one of, of the healthiest story. things that could have happened to her though. Yes, like in a hindsight type of thing, she's doing trailer living, like, you know, all this kind of, you know, healthy out of the box thinking is now mm -hmm. like erupting, emerging, becoming her thing. She's getting her own platform out of it. Good. So again, even though they try to kick you out, like they can only kick you out once. 
And then yeah. once you deal with that, they can't ever do it again. And now you got your own All site, and you got your freedom. own audience, and you got your own monetization, yeah, yeah. and you got your own, you know, outside of their stuff. Right. It's a blessing in disguise. And I, yeah. I, I, I remember yeah. when I got censored from Google AdSense, like before I was ever doing the show, I, I mean, I was just doing the website, like before I even made up the daily wrap up, like I was still primarily cannabis focused for crying out loud. And we got booted off Google AdSense. And I was, I, I wasn't even making that much. It was like barely making anything. And I just said, you know, I was, I was actually kind of crushing at the time. And I was like, well, that sucks. Like how, what am I going to do? Like affiliates and like, you know, screw all that stuff these days. Like that's just like the wrong direction in my opinion. But I, I, I was like, well, I had to build a new direction. And I said, what am I going to do? And so I, that's what, for me, that what, that's what created the donation only kind of model. And I, I've never been more, I, this is talk about freedom and independence. I mean, I don't, the mainstream doesn't even know how to wrap their mind around how this works. Like, so you mean they're not paying you for anything? <laughs> it's like, they're just giving you money because they believe in you. It's like, what? They can't, they don't understand how that works because they can't control it. You know, people are literally sending checks to my PO box because they want to support this platform, you know, because the and people I, trying to do these things don't do those things. Yeah. Right. And if they they can't understand the freedom minded people that want to support and get get a little more. I want to make sure Ryan can keep doing his things. You know, right. they don't understand that and they don't understand that which they're trying to destroy, which is part of the ignorance of them trying to destroy stuff they can't understand or control. But we'll always be ahead of them. So it's going to ebb and flow through history. But I think ultimately the universe didn't create us to be slaves. And this is like, we have to, and we should rise to this occasion and get our brains together and like, you know, out learn. I think more people. people would, would choose to be able to finance what they're interested in, even if they're not interested in stuff that we talk about. Um, it's just that, well, the old, the old sort of cable model is obviously dying out with the boomers, but at the right. same time, like yeah, today with the emergence of technology, it's yes, they're getting people to like you, YouTube and it's sort of, uh, it's prevalence right now, but give it enough time. I could see a situation where people more and more as they either wake up or find other platforms would, would pr probably prefer to, in some capacity, fund the things that they actually find entertaining or find useful or find informative. I think that's something that we would want to. I know I did 10 years ago when I found all these different platforms. I'm like, this is actually what I would want to invest my time and money in. So it's just, right. it's simple. Like, it's not very complex. It's, it's sort of like for so long, we just gave our money to a cable company and then they, they had all these various channels and we got this, that's all we got to see. But now we actually get the choice because we all can kind of be our own producers instead of consumers all of a sudden, yeah. and, or, you know, or if we're consumers, we get the more, more detailed choice as to what we want to consume. At least I would like to think that if we can reach yeah. those people. So it's interesting. It's, it's almost like it's the same kind of, it's like a small part, example of the internet conversation. You know, it's yeah. like, I think that they, they made it this way because they thought they would have more control or more, more, mechanisms by which to influence you and they're like wait 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 too late <laughs> let the cat out of the bag and now we're just making new channels and we're talking about how they lied about this on that channel and you know it's like you get to the point to where i, I think i always kind of bring this back in my mind it all comes back to why they're funneling this into the new direction they, mm -hmm. they they're trying to recapture control over what i think they lost control of i mean that's what it seems like well, what, we it was a wild out, west it had to be a wild west for it to develop but to your point now that's it developed now they have to get control over it again that's yeah that's yeah. brilliant well yeah. they were losing public trust so they needed to create a, a new terror situation that got the fear up that made people trust government again and have to rely on them because we can't fight ukraine or we can't fight russia so we have to like do this thing with governments our proxy it's daddy character going over and making sure nato's okay and you know starting off world war three if they had their yeah way. yeah that well i mean that's i you know i sadly don't think i mean i wouldn't i said if, if it came to actual kinetic war on a major worldwide scale I don't think these people would care even remotely to be quite honest, but I don't think that's what they want because I don't think that, I mean, anybody could point out why a massive outbreak of war, whether nuclear or just, you know, just generally, you know, kinetics, I guess nuclear is kinetic, but just not nuclear would, would counter what they're trying to accomplish with the great reset in every Correct. possible that's way. That's what right? I say as well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's more about a means to an end, right? They're trying to scare you into control i mean look at what they started to lose from COVID 19 they've regained with fear pushed from from this and and whether that maintains or not is up uh, up for discussion but and i also don't think that they're they i mean there's a lot of ways you could look at it i mean the climate change part of this is going to come in at some point as well i think it's just trying to keep everybody corralled in this direction and they lost control of it i really believe they lost control of the narrative around COVID 19 because of people like you because of the independent media i i believe that well, and also because it wasn't what people were experiencing, there wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship. 
between what they're being told by the mainstream media and then what they're experiencing, even with the disease or treatment options, all these different things, or the, or the vaccine. I mean, how many, there's like a six degrees of separation now with people we, that have been injured by the vaccine in some capacity, uh, friends right. and family members, I could read. So it's just like, all of a sudden the narrative wasn't matching and there's right. too many on like too many experiences with people that fall into a spectrum that's sort of pejorative, but the normie spectrum that like all of a sudden, like they just couldn't. And then Joe Rogan happens, but they know, have a, dis- that they was have a, a decision tree. They have a decision tree. I can imagine some sort of software. Right. And so they've got these goals and these goals never go away, but they either shift them faster or slower. Right. So they were growing really fast with COVID oh, bumping into a whole bunch of data that goes against that. Let's slow that down. Let's speed up this other one to let this grow behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Right. Because when I think back to like 1908, Carnegie endowment in their minutes from the Reese committee investigation, the, the first thing they figured out, is there any greater way to change a society other than warfare? And then they found out, no, there's no greater way to change society other than warfare. Then how to take, how do they take control of warfare? They took care of the state department, then they educate people. Right. But going back to this idea of great reset could be counter to uh, world war three, like world war three could wipe away their great, great reset. I see them as either way they get their great reset if they, if they continue unchallenged, right? Because um, HG Wells is things to come, uh, which was the, the movie version of his book called shape of things to come from like 1938, right before he wrote new world order in 1939, 1938, they came out with a shape of things to come. And in there, there's like a nuclear war and it sends almost the whole planet back to the stone age. Yeah. And you think in this movie, because you're in like act two of watching the 1938 MI6 production of Things to Come, and uh, the whole world is desolate and it's gangs and rocks and clubs, right? And you think this is it until wings over the world comes flying in and technology has been preserved and there is a new world order and there's a big gap, like Elysium gap between the slaves on the planet and the ruling elite who have power of, of the skies and the air. So I could see either way, like, you're right. I don't think they care if it breaks out in a world war. I don't think they care really if it even goes kinetic and hot with uh, thermonuclear weapons in a limited warfare, Kissingerian type of way and not the whole planet, just like, Mm. oh, Ukraine had some stuff happen or whatever. Um, And I think that they have a way to make their plans come about, whether we accepted the narrative without resistance on COVID or they switch gears and they bring this back over next season. And it's got, you know, well, some part COVID of me wonders too. if they're worried about because they may lose control if it turns to nuclear warfare, even like no matter how many bunkers they have, like there are, there are contingencies True. that could yeah. transcend their game theory around yeah. it. And I think they're a little bit worried about that. Whereas with because the big the World Economic Forum, one of the major policy things they want to talk about. I remember this going back to when all of a sudden the covid narrative started to shift before Ukraine and Russia even nope. No, nothing was happening there mm-hmm. and they were talking about the number one issue in 2022 is climate change so they're going to, they're starting to transition back to the climate change thing now we're talking about russia and oil and all this sort of right. nonsense and i'm like oh wait this is a perfect distraction to then get people and then they forced russia over to the credit system that's the chinese use and now they're trading oil and rubles it, that's russian currency so it's just like there's a, it actually if they can keep the war to be limited, limited warfare mm-hmm. in the Kissingerian sort of Kissinger sense of things, that's sort of perfect because it helps uh, sort of uh, hasten more quickly pushing the world to not only CBDCs and also this this net zero carbon nonsense they're talking about, all this stuff they want to push the world to, which is Club of Rome. That's just the world economic form uh, actionizing sort of action, sorry, action, really uh, making actionable the club of the precepts of the Club of Rome. And what yeah. they talked about limits to growth. Yeah. No, I, what's interesting too is they talk about like supply lines and, and shortage infrastructure. This stuff is all being exacerbated by the war as well. You know, so yes, whether yes, you interesting, got it. you see these things where, you know, like World Economic Forum starts like cold shouldering Russia, like, oh, we, we, you're not welcome at Davos. And it's like, okay, that may indicate that Russia's gone like a foul. Like, but in a way, it could be them perpetuating the idea of oh russia is fighting against the the whole thing and they're the good guy now and you know it's like controlling the dialectic and they're all german idealists the hegelian sort of idea which like they can control history metaphysics is tied up into history and that there's a dialectical sort of uh, this war of opposites going on and we can just like continue this waltz until we get to this sort of synthesis we want which is total technocratic control cbdc's top-down hierarchy like some sort of ai controlled communist utopian 
metaverse system. I mean, who knows what it can manifest as we've seen enough dystopian sort of novels and movies come about that sort of, you know, outline what it could look like. And each one of them is not very promising for us. I think us. the metaverse <laughs> is a great idea that we should plug all those people in we the plug world them government into summit. Yeah. yeah. We plug them into it and we be the Zuckerberg walking around while they're all plugged into it. And then we can have this beautiful earth to ourselves and the technocrats can like have their wet dream, Kurtz Viley and singularity all at the same time go boom. I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's seriously it, it make it a, the meta prison. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. But to, to the point about the the um, the the medical part of it, and I agree, mm. Richard. It, it, totally an interesting way to look at it. That it's about the way that they perceived it then. Like, how do we control the the, the population using warfare? And obviously, that's been something they've used and almost perfected to a degree for a long time, as long as they don't care about the casualties of civilians, which clearly they don't. But what's interesting is you can look back. I forget the date I was actually just looking for. I think it was early 1900s, the Flexner report, right? Yeah. And, and, and the Carnegie's and, and the Rockefeller's and how it's very clearly, in my opinion, they were aware of how this could be utilized, but I think they recognize that we're not there yet. We don't have the technology yet. We understand it though. So we need to ran, wrangle in the medical side of this. And by the way, and as Corbett points out, the you know how and why big oil conquered the world and how they fractured Rockefellers and acting like they were breaking them up, it really gave them more control and more influence, more money. And then ever since then, what they do? They drove the, the entire medical industry into the petrochemical pill form kind of idea. I mean, welcome Pfizer, welcome everything else. Like that's that's the beginning. And now once we get to the point that they can start realizing what they wanted, the nanotechnology, the implantables, they're like, okay, security state becomes biosecurity state. What do we yes. need? Some kind of action, some kind of pandemic. And maybe it was just organic and they go, perfect, we'll use it. I mean, who knows? I don't think necessarily, I think there's much more obvious manipulation, but you know, this is just my theory, obviously, but I think it's interesting to see how there's been planning for this for a long time. And so it really just becomes one in the same. It is still the war manipulation, but it's a war on you. It's a war on a virus. It's a right? psy war. Yes. It's a psy war more than anything. And what it really spells out, I mean, uh, and I it's agree flexner. with the elements of your theory, but long term, that means they've been talking about this. They've been they've they've designed and sort of like planned for this over uh, over a century. Yes. If you think about it, that's okay. the key. It's like they're not thinking in short term um, segments of time here. And that's, yeah. that's really point, like, look that's at, what look we at, try to get through to the audience. Like these are long term plans. Bernard like, Flexner, for the long haul, the least famous of the Flexners. He did the Palestine Economic Corporation, part of colonizing what would become Israel. Then you got Abraham Flexner, and he's also working Rockefeller Foundation projects. He does the American Medical Schools project, and that's the Flexner Report for Medical. Right. Right. And then there's Simon right. Flexner. I'm pretty sure he did the, we mentioned him earlier in the show tonight when we were talking about Cornelius Dusty Rhodes. Right a lot of synchronous. Yeah, I don't believe in coincidences. I think the universe wants people to know about Rockefeller Institute and Carnegie International Endowment for Peace. Well, and could, globalist argue, agendas. Th this is a good point to argue the logical potential. You know, I, I, I want to put it this way. I 100 percent believe that family lines and history play a huge role in these people, or the way they think with the way they're very cultish, kind of a cult, a, a, collect, a, a cult level kind of mentality from, you know, whether we're talking about the groups they grow up in from their colleges or whatever else that the family line means something to them. You know, I mean, you could even make the, that valid conversation. I mean, I don't know why this doesn't get discussed more. The whole uh, royal line president theory, that's yeah. not a theory. I mean, it's damn verifiable. I mean, it's an obvious thing that somehow they connect back to Charlemagne and a couple of other royal lines. And it could be coincidence, I guess. I don't know how that's even possible mathematically, but I think it's interesting to see that, you know, Flexner line, you know, maybe it's because they want you to see it. And I do believe there's a level of that too. Like they kind of want you to see it. So you're sort of giving permission, but I definitely think it's more than that. I think there's more of a, you know, there's a, a society like George Carlin, right? It's a big club and you ain't in it. I really believe that. I think that they keep these things going. That's why you see like the Mika Brzezinski on the morning well, Joe when yeah. Mr. Brzezinski is the beginning of all this from the seventies in Afghanistan. You got it. And, yeah. you know, it's yes. Yeah. Mujahideen. Yeah. Yeah, Operation exactly. Cyclone. Operation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look, even if you look at the Dulles family, I agree. Like, I mean, it goes back to guys... the divine right of Kings going back to the Achaemenid empire in ancient Persia. Well, I mean, they've you served can, the you can Kings. see how they, well, I mean, this idea that they have a divine right to rule eternally. And so they right. intermarry, they intermarry with other aristocratic families, they keep it in house. And that goes back even to the ancient Indian, Vedic Indian caste system. So, I mean, it's, yeah. there's something about the human mentality and psychology where once they, they gain a certain amount of power over individuals and have a certain amount of wealth, they, they sort of, they come up with this idea that they're a God. 
and well, they and they got family backing them up on it whether it's the roosevelt's or the delano's yeah. or the forbes family or the dulles family like i my asked the question a long time ago how did john foster and alan dulles these young wall street lawyers end up at the per paris versailles peace conference basically controlling like the allies side oh their uncle was a secretary of state up until i think he died he died in 1928 so he was still alive when they were doing that so they're acting proxies for him and who's he oh he comes from this famous lansing family but also john w foster's up here and you can wow. see now john foster dulles is named after john w foster and they have a long history of working for u.s state department and woodrow wilson and you know these other things back colonel house up you know very influential over robert lansing so these other things that came into like our purview like we know about the dulleses and the colonel or like a colonel house and these sort of things but to see like you know who was colonel house's the continuity dad? right yes. the continuity right. yeah That's colonel like, house's dad not to was mention like that Justice butler in gone with the wind he was like a confederate bootlegger yes. dealing with the british and that's why colonel house was a guy of power from beaumont texas who wasn't let's well, not forget about louis brandeis too i mean i'm not talking about the well, he's friends with there, the flexners he's friends with the flexners and yeah. he's also a zionist and he's sitting on the supreme court during what oh, the z word yeah, that, word you have to i mean that the zionist element of this is damn it, near everywhere i mean it, yes. we, and this is the thing i'm so glad today that people are finally beginning to kind of break this kind of like narrative control around like anything negative about Israel is somehow racist or anti-Semitic. It's, I mean, are there people that are anti-Semitic and racist? Yes, of course there are. But does that mean every criticism of Israel falls in that category of any, a child would see that that's ridiculous, right. but it, it's being broken. Like remember, remember the days when there is no Palestine or everyone in Palestine's a terrorist, how those narratives even were allowed in an, an honest discussion is beyond me, but we're, we're past that now. And I, I just came to the point about um, who was it? I was just talking about this. Oh, it was it was uh, Kolomoisky. The 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 he's the primary backer financially of Zelensky. Funded his campaign, gave him security, oh, cars, yeah, yeah, everything, yeah. Yes, and he's also yeah. the guy who owns the TV station that used to work with Zelensky and then became the cabinet. This this is no joke, by the way. His cabinet and his presidential cabinet were the people that worked at the TV station. Yeah. You can look this up on Wikipedia. No, no, it's joke. true. Yeah, we have that's all documented. Yeah, so but so it's uh, how they could have a president who played the piano with his dick and also dances so well in those high heels. <laughs> Because like, whereas Trump owned, like he's a billionaire and he was the star on the show where he makes the decisions like this guy proxied it out to Zelensky and then was like, hey, maybe that Robin Williams movie where he becomes president as a comedian could could work in Ukraine. Like it flies over there. It didn't fly. But no, not many. It was good part reviews. of a documentary called uh, Star Suckers talking about how we're going to move that direction. I mean, it already had happened with I mean, we already had Ronald Reagan in the 80s. Right. So it's not right. Like, yeah, the first one. So, yeah. Or one, was he the first? I think it was at least the first. I think he right? was at least yeah from Hollywood directly and some right. Past, and yeah. prominent actor, I meant yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what, what's interesting though is, I mean, you you can see the the need for this, like the the influence that these actors have over the mind and the individual from a young age, like because you know children don't care about politics, but they sure as hell care about that person on the TV. Yes. You know, it, it resonates <laughs> with them, and so you can see the Zelensky part of it where they primed this. Like he literally cool. played the president and like you, you, you could say this on Twitter, like a couple, like a month ago and people would have called you fake news because they just can't believe that actually happened. He literally played the president and then became the president. It's like, really? It's like, that's ridiculous. Nope. It's certainly true. But the, the point was Kolomoisky, who not only was the primary backer of this guy who is, you know, openly sort of like an extremist himself, but he is an open Zionist. He now lives in Tel Aviv. His son's name is Israel. And guess what? He's also one of the primary backers and funders of the Azov Battalion. It's all on the record. I was just going to say, yeah, that, I saw some news about that this week. How he's back. That's what makes yes. people's heads yeah, go I have a Jimmy boom, Dore clip dude. About that, because I was like, you know, yeah. uh, of you course, know, Jimmy Dore talks. You probably watched my show and then didn't give me credit for it. It's the modern <laughs> version. It's the modern version of using Reinhard Galen to train the Mossad in the early days. When you're like, why are the Nazis training does, the actually. new Israeli special defense forces and stuff, right? This is the same thing, because like even my dad said, well, how can they have Nazis over there when their president's Jewish? And it's like, <laughs> you know, it's like it's a complicated situation Dad. <laughs> like they, they work really hard at you know, making it all confusing for people. But to but Ryan's point, it is like, can I, uh, let, me, let me address yeah, that really go, quickly, go, real though, quick. That's that's so frustrating to me because I don't even think that's a it's not that complicated. I know. Why I was just going to say it's not complicated. recognize that someone Jewish can work. There were Jewish collaborators during World War Two. I mean, why if that should be the end of that conversation? You should laugh at for making that argument because it's subjective yeah. and it doesn't even make sense. A minority of the Jew of uh, Jewish people also made up the uh, the um, the German army. 
not part of the SS, say, but yeah, more part German, of the German Hitler army. Had German right. officers. So who it were was Jewish not as well. in German yeah, officers sure. as well that were SS, actually SS. So that's a whole separate. So I mean, like, let's people need to take a step back a little bit. No, people right, do. Right. To Ryan's point, they do get incented or incendiary over any mention of Zionism. But I want to show, even yeah. in the official story, this is Paris 1919 by Margaret McMillan, oh, yeah. it's a good book. the granddaughter of David Lloyd George who was uh, prime minister of UK at that time of England of the, at that time, Paris, 1919, the last chapter is all, all about Zionism, uh, Zionism, the Balfour declaration, Colonel house, right. British Israelism. Like it's here in the official story. So right. the, you know, the people who make those arguments, first off, you're not even acquainted with like the official story in our culture that's out there on these topics, it let alone the authoritative anything. texts that underpin and the other people who were there and their testimony to what happened and why, yeah, it's it's been socially engineered over the years. I mean, this has been an agenda. That's what we were kind of just talking about. It's kind of ebbed and flowed, right? Like they got a really successful push with this narrative, like where, oh yeah, there was never even a Palestine. Well, here's Golda Meir, one of the founding members, openly saying she was a Palestinian. Oh, you're fake news. You know, it's like they don't even care. But now we've gotten to a point to where people are more open to it. You're realizing there's more behind the story, you know, and it's it's really frustrating though, because it's such an obvious sidestep. You know, that they, and I mean, I always point out yeah. that there's there are gigantic orthodox jew organizations in israel that are openly saying zionism has stolen our religion and is yes. literally hijacking this and using oh, yeah. it and so i'm not saying i even necessarily agree or don't agree i do have my opinion but that's not the point they are jewish people and they open orthodox jewish people and they are screaming and I, there's videos of that those kind of groups getting beat up by the idf because they don't say the right thing like how does that even make sense in the and then it also thing? went on under covid where they cracked down on Orthodox right. Judaism yeah. in Israel. Cause what I saw was Israeli police beating Orthodox Jews. And if you would have turned it black and white and said, this is world war two, people would be like, that's world war two. It's the same situation. It's very ironic by the way, after, you know, the history that had been suffered that it's like turning turn around and do it to Pal- because the, police the Gaza aren't Strip. different just because they're in Israel. They're following order orders. Well, how, how about this? How about the idea that you can we can talk about the Palestinian situation for for decades and decades, and then suddenly the Israeli people themselves become the very thing that I mean, COVID nineteen. I mean, yeah. you, did you see how the many boosters. Israeli people yeah. were outraged about this? I mean, well, they have a right to be. They they yeah. were like, go ahead and use the Israeli people. Use them. Right, Pfizer's like we have a whole test group. It's called Israel. They, they yeah. openly said that they called it five, yeah. they called it the world's lab. That's right. their words. So Israeli people were rightly outraged. I think they lost a lot of control right there. I really do. They also yeah. one of the first ones institute that green pass. I mean, I was seeing yes. video going back how they already had it uh, sort of in place and in institutions like McDonald's and just your everyday like places that people would frequent. And yeah, you literally could not order from the kiosk unless you could scan your green. Right. I mean, and then of course, three, four booster shots and, this stuff being just completely belligerent with their activity in regards to what they're doing to their own citizenry. And so it's sort of like they, it's almost like they imported the Nazi model, you know, into, yes. uh, into well, Israel I mean, and then is, sort of the gaslit heart. the public by saying, Oh, you suffered under the Nazis. So we have the right to do this to you or some, some crazy oh, sort of contradictory premises of that nature. And they just go, Oh, but they're Jewish. So you're wrong. Right. That, yeah, that's right. that sidestep right there. Right. <laughs> no, and it's like, right. well, that's not the point. I mean, I, I tried to show this in the conversations of the Aza battalion and the CIA fascism building is it's like look guys the government of israel has openly been called out for funding the aza battalion back when they were openly calling them a neo-nazi group right even because they still are today they always have been but there was a moment where the western press like right up until 2021 the end of it were still going they're bad and dangerous then it shifted they're like no they're on our side you know it's like just this shift shift. just happened yeah i'm understanding that's the thing yeah but my point is that israel it was it was caught funding them and their own people were like are you funding nazis and the point is even haaretz wrote about it well it's not the first time they've done this they've done it here they've done it here the u.s government there's declassified documents where the the u.s government was openly working with nazis not working with like project paperclip or dr ishii after the fact but during and collaborating with nazis so why are we even having the conversation like we shouldn't be able to point at history that they told us about and now we're not supposed to talk about it it's just it's everything means nothing today i mean there was a shared ideology i mean this is a a topic i I run town hall every other week for the gtw community and a topic was brought up that like for how as great as someone like nikola tesla was and he was certainly an incredible figure in history he was also a eugenicist. And so we brought up our articles True. about eugenicist, about how he saw society at 2100. And I think it was from the Atlantic Journal or something like that. I forget. I have to look at the publication again. But it was back in like 1935. 
July something, 1935, where he's talking about sort of the vision of the future. And I, I had to tell the group, I'm like, look, I have a lot of respect for Nikola Tesla and uh, his sort of war against Einstein and all this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, and also giving us uh, the modern world, literally the modern world. But at the same time, use this as an example of just how rife this was in the culture among any most of the intellectual elites of that day. This was just commonplace. Eugenics was a commonplace idea. This was not, it was out in the open. You can go back and find posters about it. And it's sort of the positive eugenic sense, not the negative <laughs> eugenics. They had literally, I forget who coined that term. Uh, it'll come to me in a little, that's from the 19th century, but they talk about positive and negative eugenics. I want to say it's Colton, but I'll have to go back and look that up. Nonetheless, well, but, but, they, but to the point, it's just like, this was popular to a certain extent, at least among the intellectual elite, the intellectual intelligentsia across the world, not just in America, but also in Germany. So they had a shared ideology. They also had a shared ideology. The new thing. Like, he, you know, yeah, experts right. out of their area. What is it? The, the Gell the Gel man effect that the Michael Gell Crichton man, yeah. coined. Yeah. You know? And he what? wined and dined with elites because he needed funding from private entities oh, yeah. to do his project. So it wasn't anything like out of the ordinary. For me, it was just like, I can I can separate out his genius from the fact that he's also human and understand the tragedy that exists there and that we should we should use him as an example of making sure we 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 hedge against really bad ideas. He didn't the have the internet to know that JP Morgan was a pit viper. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't he had to find well, that out later when he stripped down the warden clip the, the, yeah. the interesting part about this is it goes as, to your point, it goes very recently. I don't know what the date was, but I mean the Galton Institute was literally called the Eugenics Institute yeah, Eugenics Eugenics Foundation right. or something like that. Like right, very recently. You know, it's it's like and these are people that are involved in COVID right now, you know, Dude, it's, right it's up to a, right up to the turn of the century. It was nineteen ninety, like the, they changed it or something the like Bill that. Bill Gates That's how thing, it was crazy. called the Population Control Council. <laughs> it was straight up like here's Jeez. Bill Gates and popular, you know, it was his family, I think, that was speaking at it. But. So crazy. And then yeah. you see what they get into, which is the sort of the envisionment or the embodiment and manifestation of what was talked about in the Flexner report and sort of yes. this new oil based exactly. medicine, this sort of institutionalized Playing medicine. God. Yeah. Just playing god on. now it's now we have what gene therapies running around oh god and so it's, it's like it's getting yeah. it's getting so I, the, what's going on behind the scenes is what scares me right now because we don't me know too. like exactly like we didn't know this was really happening the way it really is and we, we theorize but it's like god it scares me same with in space by the way i bring that up all the time i mean it's like we're so distracted with what's going who knows what's going on up there right now like they, they could have i mean it's not this is not crazy they could no i have a friend that works in aerospace yeah, he tells me some of the stuff that goes on like they're they're 50 75 years in advance of anything they would tell the public and the big yeah. thing that really bothers me is it's not it's what's in like the sort of lower atmosphere just like outside the earth's like sort of uh initial layers they have like the stratosphere the tropos- tropopause all that stuff like they have these satellites that can take like high definition resolution that's just constantly photographing every single aspect of america and other nations mm. they're cloaked they sort of sort of like the ability to bend light around itself. So it's just like there's really advanced technology going on in regards to being able to it's spy on their own citizenry. Some people think they're just going to hide in a forest somewhere. Good luck, yeah, uh, especially yeah, with sort of the infrared yeah. technology and stuff that's going on, ability to cloak itself and do like 4K high def resolution stuff. And this is from he said these are army men and sort of uh, that went to work at what Je- is Jeff Bezos is. Um, Blue Origin. So he was telling me like what he talks about from what they were doing in the army and all these like special uh, special projects. And these are like his managers, you know, he was tasked with like the designing a, a network system for a rocket ship. And he left recently because he couldn't stand the sort of bureaucracy involved there. But he was just telling me like this, these are the type of people that are already telling me like, this is what's up there. And yeah. I was like, Jesus Christ, like that's kind right. of, so you good luck hiding. It was his well, point. <laughs> yeah. And imagine, imagine that level of advancement, but in like bio nano research, you know, like right. smart dust was around. I keep talking about this smart dust, this, the, the, the size yeah. of like the eighth, the size of a grain of salt or like the sheet of a paper, like these things were the, around in 2007, 2009, there's these, discussions about smart dust that was literally so like it, it would it could blow it like dust it could land your skin and your own your body's own motion would would work i mean this was being discussed i've seen i saw there's an open discussion like it was like a wearables kind of like a, a symposium and it was like yeah. 2014 and he was pointing back at this research from like 2007 he's like you know imagine where it is now it's probably being used i don't know why we wouldn't think about that you know it's such a crazy ex- escalation that we have no control over it really is alarming we're in a a dangerous time right now, especially when they're sort of backed into a corner. 
Yeah, that's the thing. If they get back into a corner, and that's one of the sort of harrowing, sort of pretentious warnings of people like Carl Sagan and, and like even Carol Quigley, which obviously tragedy and hope, and what we talk about all the time is that at periods of time, paradoxically, when there was the greatest amount of freedom, we had equal armament, equal technology between the population and the government. Now we have the, maybe the greatest gap in all of human history. Oh, yeah. And that's then we have the greatest amount of slavery in all of human history. And I just, I, I always play with that or ruminate on those, I, that idea in the back of my mind. I'm like, I wonder if there's some sort of, it's not just a correlation. There's like something causative there is like mm-hmm. when we have such a huge power gap, which is a knowledge, a knowledge gap necessitates a power gap when the knowledge gap is basically a few it's also a wealth gap. engineer it's also and a wealth it's a technology gap. gap they're all you the same it. thing all the same thing it's all eugenics and, and that all falls in the same category yes right? i mean right. you're, it's it's a it's a tiered society but it's also based on that exact fact they're deciding who is and who is not you know the haves and have nots i mean it's the same idea so you know, it's that, part the island it's part elysium it's like luke radowski t-shirt with the venn diagram <laughs> of all the dystopian movies <laughs> what what's uh yeah what's uh, the time machine world called the more Murlocs and that's what and I the Eloy, the Murlocs and the Eloy. Murlocs. That's what I always think about. That's yeah. I mean, there's that's actually the best analogy for where like an organically divided society would end up. I mean, you're going to become yeah. like different entities. That's what we talk about, like the genetic manipulation. Yeah. This isn't even like a hypothetical. Like if you literally create the ability to engineer yourself and it's only going to be given people that can afford it it would be a matter of generations before you're like literally different species because you're going to make yourselves smarter, faster. It's just going to exactly what that is. It's, it's and they would separate themselves to keep safe. Like that's sort of what Dune talks herd. about with the, the spice trade a little bit. Like we'll get a, whether it's a, and yeah. whether there's technologies or there's a special drug they develop. Like it makes mm-hmm. people there's, there's a, this was from new scientists in June 7th. Let me bring this up. Oh no, that's not it. Well, there's a so there's a. I remember it was either in the BBC. It was one of these scientific journals talking about in 200, 200,000 years or something. There's there's or twenty thousand years. They're talking about how there's going to be a genetic divergence between human beings. There will be a different species emerging. Which, so they which, and they're looking to perceive like whether that's true or not. They want to see, seemingly want to manifest that. Well, my joke is going to be that, which means it's probably going to happen in like five years. Right? That's <laughs> right. what they do. They're like, this is like, like I always make the joke about like fourth, like Klaus Schwab joking about the fourth industrial revolution. Right. They, they play these videos that were like like five years ago where he's talking about the fourth industrial revolution of the implantables and all this stuff. And people right. listen to that and they think, oh, that's like way that's like like reading boys life when you're 10 about flying cars. You're like, man, that's yeah. like forever. Yeah. Right but no, that's being built right now. And you didn't know that. You know, it's like that's what that really means right there. Here it is. I found it. Human species may split into human humans. Humanity may split into two subspecies. This is from October 17th, 2006 <laughs> bottom picture. That's the subspecies on a hundred. Right. I know. Look how they, this is what they view it as, right? A hundred thousand years time as predicted by HG Wells. An expert has said so the London school of economics, London school of economics. There we go. the Fabian <laughs> socialists sponsored by the Rothschilds Unreal, had to say man. that it's a genetic upper class it, so it's not even like a story about different group of people. We call it manifest. It's destiny. like the people who bring you that story are the people creating the World Government Summit and the World Economic Forum and well, those other things we see pro- today. It's probably not true because we can't account for speciation evolutionary theory. That's a whole other issue. But they're trying to force it through those new strange technologies they're developing in some capacities. Yeah. So. They want to crack the code on life to have command and control of all life known in the universe didn't they see yeah. the alien the ridley scott films like every time you try to do that you just create a more sort of rapacious demonic creature in the process so all right know. maybe they're into that stuff though. well yeah well, i mean i play a clip all the time uh, from a great documentary i forget what it's called i think it's something inc or incorporation or something it's, it's about the genetic you know mapping and and the way mm. that this has been like a wild west for a while now where like the moment they got this certain lawsuit or forget the name of it it just kind of opened these doors and it's just this endless map every single new life form they come across now technically it's not supposed to apply to humans but there's like loopholes to how this is working even now but they've basically yeah. mapped and like patented almost everything they can yes and that's crazy alarming and that's they've the sequenced practically everything that's right. the well, scary the, thing the patenting part of it phylogenetic is tree because you get into the idea of whether or not the injection they're giving people, and this is not, I, look, this is not whether or not. They just don't want to admit the fact. There have been at least five or six peer-reviewed, peer-reviewed scientific articles that have come out that said this does alter your DNA. So yes. the point is, does that then make you something that they've patented? 
And that's not some conspiratorial concept, like legitimately. It, it exists as a precedent already exactly. in, in, in regards to grain, like GMO crops and corn or soil. I mean, that's already been determined. And that's something that when we had Patrick Wood on, he was talking about, he was talking about Steve Bannon of all people who was, you know, an advisor for Trump and sort of policies. And he thinks the next big policy push is going to be this exact issue. Like uh-huh. what is identity? What is identity? And like, that's scary coming from someone like that. who's been on the inside a little bit. Okay, if he's pushing that it. much, because it's like, oh, that's. That's very ominous for what's coming in the future then, because to your point, you're exactly right. There's already precedent set in the world of agriculture. Is that just going to transfer over to human beings as such? Is Yeah, That's it's scary crazy to think there. about. Well, hey, I, LD, I, I, do we have do we have that other clip from the World uh, Government Summit? There was like a five minute clip that we were looking for. Did we ever find that? Because what I wanted to do was I wanted Ryan to showcase uh, his publication and where people can get his links. And then I wanted to bring Derek on and maybe have Ryan stay and hang out because we're going to talk about an article published on his site. But I also wanted to get that clip on the record so we could talk about it together. Did we find it? Uh, so make... cl- <clears throat> which whose clip was oh, that? Man. I think it's, there's it, hours and hours. So I was like trying to look through, but it's difficult. Yeah. I don't know. Like without a more like detailed. Yeah. Okay, I, I am so probably going to have to get out of here in the, in the next 10 minutes or so. So I'm, I'm, I'm all right, right on. Let's, all right. So let's, questions. let's do this. Let's uh let's sign Ryan out. We'll do, go to a clip. Then we'll bring Derek on Ryan. Where can we find your, fu- your fine work that we abbreviate all the time. So carelessly as T lab without telling people the whole URL. You? No worries. The last American vagabond. I'm down to hang out for a little crossover. If you want to ask yeah, us cool. questions together, that's fine. But yeah, the last American vagabond.com. As always, that's the the best place to go. And so don't, as I always say, don't let if don't if let I made this be the conduit between us, them, you, you and our information, essentially, right? Go directly to the source. Always. We have a lot of members of our community that was were very excited. Fantastic. Thank you for coming on and sharing, you know, having a conversation with us. They My really pleasure. love your work and they Thank promote you. you all the time within our community. And so we try to, that's our future is because I can't go through all three hours because of how busy I am during the week. I'm trying to get people Likewise. on the inside of our community to get, get us clips that we can show throughout our show. So that's the Thank future you. project. The other thing is, um, uh, there's this, are you aware of this truth art show? LD, did you see that comment? About uh, oh yeah, Ryan Rich, got Richard in there, that right? Ryan may include his music in the Truth Art Show AU client GTW. I don't think Ryan knows the Truth Art Show is connected with Richard. Is there anything you want to say to that? Or I just I want to get that on the record before we let Ryan go. So he's a, oh the Blowback Gallery July uh, Truth Art uh, Festival. Yeah, I got a I got an installment. Something about including Ryan's music or something like that. I mean, we have a yeah. conversation in the background of, of you know. Yeah, that's so. awesome. I I don't think I, I don't know I, I I don't know if I knew it was connected to you guys. That's awesome. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, so it's a it's an art show, I guess, where the music will be playing. Is that is somebody reached out to me about that? Yeah. Okay, so good, good. Uh, Stephanie probably reached out to you. The guy who owns the gallery, his name's Jeff Medine. He's in Pueblo, Colorado. His art, his his gallery has featured like truth, nine like eleven truth type uh, art over the years. These sort of things. So he's having a. Uh, uh, a get together this summer, uh, an art gallery kind of in person get together. But I'm I'm submitting a virtual exhibit because I'm doing one on uh, Mark Lombardi and how he influenced my creation of the history blueprint and kind of right. so you know it doesn't have to be painting on a canvas on a wall. You're a right. musician, music's good for me, kind of educational art like I've done. And uh, yeah, I'm looking for other people. I was trying to round up Anthony Frida and a couple other people I knew that would be interested in a gig like that. But that's good mentioning, Tony. Good thinking. Good looking out yeah, for Jeff. Very cool. Oh, that's actually Stephanie that messaged us. And she oh, right on. Yeah, good. Because so I'm not Thank looking. You, at, I don't look at messages during the show, Stephanie. So you got to hit Tony up. <laughs> it's honestly thanks to the fact I can't stand the way Zoom does it and has this little Q and A box and yeah. it just sits there. Anyways, well, so. but to what you said in general, Tony, I, I really, I, I really respect what you guys do as well, and I'm so glad that you're doing the same thing in long form in the same way. You know, it, it's just so invaluable today. So I just, I thank you. For and the crossover is perfect because we focus so much on history, and then you also bring in history to current events. And so there's like a, there's, a, it's, it's a likeness, a similarity, a sort of an analogy there where it works together so seamlessly. So we super appreciate it, and we hope to have it on again. This is fantastic. So yeah, first time you. I got to interact, so I really appreciate getting to meet you. Yeah, me too. Nice to meet you, Tony. Yeah, nice to meet you. All right, well. so Ryan, you're welcome to hang out until you have something better to do. Derek, how are you doing tonight, man? <laughs> Good to see you. Hey, what's up, brother? Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, right? You're I'm busy, good. man, getting stuff done every day of the week, in person, online. You're like a man of many spaces all the time. How you been? 
Well, I was I drove for seven and a half hours today and just got out of the car a couple hours ago. So having my midnight smoothie before bed and uh, <laughs> got a, another seven hour drive tomorrow. I'm on the, the last couple of days of the Mexico activation tour. We've been on the road for five weeks now, spreading the message around Mexico. Yeah, I've been seeing your post, man. I think it's amazing. You, you get to do so much in person doing the work, whereas a lot of people are tied to just like their outlet is online but you do it online and in person. And then this past week, you wrote this incredible article, but I don't want to talk to you about that article. I want to talk to you about the article you wrote in November about the, uh, uh, wait, no, it's this one. It's this one. Cause I thought this was awesome. The great narrative in the metaverse part one. <laughs> yeah, that one, the, that was a fun one. <laughs> Let me put it on the screen. Cause I think it ties in it's Klaus Schwab and Dubai and UAE and all the sort of stuff we're seeing in this past week. And the other article that, that we'll get to in a second, but there was a lot of good parts in here that I thought, you know, I just wanted to put it on people's uh, radar about this great narrative conference. And then the, the criminal, the human rights violations of the UAE that's hosting the current world government summit, right? It's all so like six months ago, some of the problems that they were discussing about, hey, this is kind of baggage is now uh, here's the new article. While you were distracted by Will Smith, the international elitists met at the world government summit. I didn't see the article right away. I saw you tweet about it before you published it. And I was like, what? Because all I had seen is the slap, bro. All I was seeing was Chris Rock and Will Smith. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's a world government summit. And then when I get into your article and I dig into it and I get into the source material and watching these videos, I'm like, these people have done this before. Why didn't I know about this? Did you know about this? Have you covered this in past years? Oh, you're muted. Could you repeat that again, Richard? I'm sorry yeah, if I yeah. cut in and out. I have an unstable connection. Not a probably. problem, bro. And I won't keep you too long either, but I did want to plug this fine work because like sometimes, it. sometimes, you know, internet doesn't really get to read all the stuff that you write. And uh, I wanted to point out this is hey, this hey, the Richard, first year. Can I jump in real quick? I'm just gonna go ahead and say because I, I want to let you guys talk with Derek. I just I know yeah. I thought there was gonna be an overlap, or whatever, but I, I'll let you guys get into it. Derek does such great work for T Lav, and I hope you guys check out these articles because they are out out amazing like they really are like this has been blowing up to lab site for the last couple of days and it's exactly what you guys missed if you were focused on the slap we were just talking about that derek the, the slap so it's kind of a funny crossover but i'll let you guys chat hey thanks for having me on guys and nice talking with the audience and everybody else so have right a good on night. ryan yeah we'll catch you later have a great night ryan what makes the grand theft world podcast unique invigorating exciting and informative most other podcasts out there are either doing straight up interviews or they're just covering the daily news they're covering current events from the day they happen and that is effective it's useful it's a great starting point point. and then sometimes these current events change during the week past the first story so we like to give it a little time you have to wait till some of the dust settles on these stories in order to give them accurate coverage and the other thing that's really missing in the media landscape is covering the articles that are coming out every day. That's great. That's necessary. But who's bringing in contextual history so that you can understand what has been going on for decades and decades to lead up to the machinations and actions that we see unfolding today. So what we do here on the podcast is we cover current events. Many of these things are censored, but we wait about a week. As a forensic historian, I focused mainly through my career on the history of globalism and collectivism and things that they call maybe the new world order. There's a lot of facts to these sort of circumstances, groups, events, activities, working groups that they've had over time. So for Grand Theft World listeners, we not only break down the current events, most of which that are censored during the week, we provide you with contextual history, we give you the source notes, the references, we do deep dives, and this really empowers you with an understanding of context and history so that you can make more informed decisions in your life. There's also a community, a membership where you guys can actually ask questions and we can get in the show and share evidence. And there's a town hall weekly for Grand Theft World for those who listen to it and are interested in covering the stories that we don't get to during a six hour show. Listening to it an hour a day, you could uh, easily consume the week's news, but you're gonna have substance and meaning and context and understanding. And with that, you can make higher quality decisions in your life. So if you're interested in more quality in your life, go to grandtheftworld.com, click podcast at the top, and we'll see you there. Thank you. These allegations are false. This isn't Grand Theft Auto, folks. This isn't a video game.
What are the most surprising things that you discovered once you started pulling on that thread, who he was connected to, what institutions he was influential over, what events he participated in? Come on, man. What are you talking about? Come on, man. No. You don't have to think about it, dude. I got this quote because uh, you said you didn't know much about Klaus Schwab. I made it my job to, as soon as this happened, I'm like, okay, this guy's their front man. Let me learn about the official history of the World Economic Forum. I got their 40 year history. I got every book that Klaus Schwab has written or ghost written. I went through those books. This is one of the most interesting passages. Come on, man. Come on.